Good evening and welcome to day two of the Forge Debates. You are joining me and Kate Proctor today in the SU officers office. This is where the candidates will be hoping to be sitting this time next year. Last night we had the debates of President, SU Development Officer, ISO and Sports Officer. This evening we are going to have Women's Officer, Welfare Officer and Education Officer. Now first up is Women's Officer. Kate, what do you think we can expect from this debate? Well, David, I'm hoping for a really interesting debate tonight. Um, there's lots of similarities between the different policies that the different women's officers have, but there's some nuances between them. So hopefully we should hear some more detail about how they're going to hopefully um, enact their different plans. And of course, women's officer is responsible for not just the inclusion of women within the university, it's also for LGBT, mature, disabled and BME students. How important a role do you think that is to have within the university? I think it's very important. I mean, there's a level of overlap with some of the other roles, particularly welfare in terms of the provision, looking after those different um, groups as well. But I think that's something that particularly in today's age is particularly important for um, the different candidates to consider, really. Do you have a particular candidate that you think is a one to watch for this women's debate? Um, I'm personally thinking Rosa, actually. Um, she's currently um, heavily involved in the Women's Committee and that should be um, interesting. I think she's got a lot of um, know-how there, so she's definitely one to listen to and she's got some interesting policies, yes. Okay, and looking forward to the other debates, is there a particular category you're looking forward to hearing? Um, in terms of what the different later on debates? Yeah, do you think the one's going to be the most intense because people are going to oh, conflict? Yeah. I think what activities, I think uh, that one's going to be the most, I think there's a lot of um, really strong candidates there and they're going to really want to be striving for those roles, so yes. Okay, and if you're unaware, activities officer this evening will be split into two parts as there are so many people running for the role, it would only be fair to split it into two to allow them to have their own individual say. Now that will be last up this evening, but before then, of course, you have the women's officer, education officer, welfare, and then, of course, we will get on to activities. First up is the women's officer that we're going to have this evening, and I think it's going to be a great debate. Lots of exciting policies to come. Kate, are there any last remarks you want to make before we go over to the debate? Just good luck to all the candidates. So we're going to hand over in a few moments time to Cameron and the team who's going to begin the debates. They are based today on the balcony of the Students' Union here in the University of Sheffield. It should be a great debate, hopefully lots of respectful but uh, interesting policy disagreements. I think it will be interesting to see how they can enlighten us on some of the specifics of the policies they have, how they'll look to implement them, and hopefully it should be a really good evening and it will inspire lots of people to vote for the different candidates and people who perhaps haven't been involved in student politics before will watch this debate, Kate, and decide to get involved in the future. Yes. So if you're not aware already, you can catch all the coverage on www.forgetoday.com forward slash elections. You can also follow us on Twitter at Forge Press and you can also keep up to date on Instagram by searching Forge Press. We have a live blog that you can be following throughout this election debate coverage. There will also be, of course, coverage on Forge TV to watch afterwards and there will be coverage in our paper that you can find anywhere throughout the Students' Union. So do stay tuned throughout all the great coverage this evening. We are estimating to be finished at around about 9 30 and we'll be having an interval before we get through into the middle there so lots of great things to be looking forward to this evening and now i'm going to throw over to cameron for the first debate hello and welcome to the second night of forge debates for the 2019 su officer elections i'm joined for the first debate of this evening by all of the candidates for women's officer so uh, how are we all are we all okay yes yep. good yeah. thank you a yeah. little bit nervous <laughs> a little bit. okay so we'll get right into it. Uh, everybody in their manifesto in some way touches on consent and sexual consent. Um, how would you improve the talks on consent that students get from, for example, residence life? Should we start with um, Rosa? Um, so I think the main problem with the residence life talks within Freshers was that A, they were optional and B, I don't think they were particularly comprehensive. I feel like the people who led them, whilst they did really, really important work, I feel like it was very much, it felt like they were ticking a box and it was talk about consent and then that was it and that was the only time we really touched on it. So I think if I was women's officer, I'd make the conversation around consent, um, make it throughout our time at university, so not just in the first week of freshers and then we leave it at that. So I'd make introductory lectures on around consent and make sure that all freshers students get that, but as well as that, I also want that second years and third years, when they start again after the summer, they also need to have these conversations as well. Grace? Yep, so I agree with a lot of Rose, what, we wrote, sorry, what Rose was saying. Um, I think that at the moment, the consent talks are quite secular, so they're very 
one stream. I think we need to try and understand how consent and the issues of lack of consent at universities affecting different types of women. So how is it affecting women of colour differently to white women? How is it affecting um, LGBT plus women, non-binary people? Um, I also think we need to focus more on um, online dating platforms. I think platforms such as Tinder have expanded and blown up far more quickly than the university has been able to cape, um, cope with and kind of educate students, especially first years, on how this is going to affect how they kind of present themselves online and how other people are going to treat them online. Sarah? Again, like, I kind of agree with what they're saying. Consent education needs to start as soon as we start university. It shouldn't be optional because everyone needs to know about it. And the depth and breadth of consent needs to be explained and explored in a lot more detail than it is now. Because currently it is very tick a box, consent, yes, no, and done. And it's not that simple. And people need to know about that. And Cara? Um, so I actually was working as a consent champion last year so I know a lot about the system that's already in place and we do actually have a very dedicated team at this university that works towards um, improving consent training on campus and I think our university compared to other universities does a lot about consent which means we have a good model to boost and like Rosa was saying I think we should do introductory lectures for all years in the first week of term so then there's a couple of days in uni in September where everybody's having these talks and it increases the conversations between students like beyond just the interaction with the consent champion and who they're talking to it provides a platform for us as students to talk about our experiences which will kind of break down the taboo about talking about consent which will also hopefully lead to people being more open and like um, coming forward if they've experienced sexual assault because um, apparently, according to a study last year, 62% of students in 153 universities in the UK have been sexually assaulted, but only 6% of these students uh, report them to their university. So I think another massive thing which we need to improve um, regard with regards to consent is making the sexual assault disclosure form more visible and more available to students. How would you respond to that? No, I think that's a really, really good idea um, in terms of the idea about making the, the reporting system kind of more open to people. Because I, I think at the moment there's quite a lot of sort of like confusion about who to speak to, where to go and where to access these services. So I think as a university and as women's officer, our job should be to make sure that everybody on campus knows exactly where they need to go and who to speak to and that it shouldn't just be a case of reporting it then and then that's kind of it do you know what i mean we need to ensure that people are we're following it up and there's a welfare team in place that can continue to give these people support because it's not as easy as just you know reporting it and then holding that, that that person to account and then leaving it because there's obviously a lot of trauma that comes along with it and i think it needs to be it needs to continue right you know further than just that reporting system i guess um, I'd also like to add that there's a lot of stigma about what is <coughs> considered too small of an issue to report. I think a lot of people have like maybe like a bit of verbal abuse thrown at them on a night out and they don't think that's enough to report and bring it up even though it's probably quite emotionally scarring. So I think awareness of what is the fact that there is no such thing as too little of an issue to bring up. Mm. Because the SU does have a zero tolerance uh, approach to sexual harassment and, and of course sexual violence. Um, do you think that the way that that's sometimes um, implemented is, is enough? No. no. Like the procedures that we currently have in place aren't visible enough. They take far too long to be resolved mm. and they're not resolved in a zero tolerance matter. We hear stories of women students on campus that have reported issues and they're just not appropriately dealt with. And if any woman is left feeling uncomfortable on campus because of a past event, that's not zero tolerance. Mm. One of my key manifesto points is about like making sure there's support for women and sexual assault is a big deal. So making sure a, a proper support network is in place and easily accessible is really important to me.
Um, I'd also just like to follow on from your comment to make sure that actually all students feel safe about reporting consent. It's not just a female issue. Mm. And especially in the trans community because 64% of transgender people experience sexual assault. And like people don't talk about it. You know, we talk about girls, are they safe on a night out? Like stay away from scary boys. But it's such a wider issue than that. It's all genders, all sexualities. And those those minority groups need a voice. And I think that's a massive thing that we have to push in our consent talks um it's you like touch on that there the role of women's officer um obviously it's in the name um is to look after women but it's also um all manner of minority and liberation groups um across the su and university um how would you go about dressing the needs of for example like lgbt plus students or bme students who maybe like you don't um identify with but you know it's still your responsibility to to uh look after um, yep, so I'd just like to say that um, as a woman of colour, like, that's obviously something that I have a lot of experience with on campus. Um, being a student of colour at Sheffield is, is difficult because it's very hard sometimes to feel like you're represented by your university, um, whether that be visibility on campus, um, the kind of SU, SU nights that are provided for us. Um, in our education, the curriculum is exceedingly white male um, heteronormative as well so I think it's very important to actually ask the groups of people that we need to speak for and understand what is the big issues on campus and I think me personally I understand that the education curriculums at the moment is a very large issue. Um, the attainment gap at Sheffield is something that isn't very widely spoken about. Um, in Britain is 15.2% between BME students who enter university with the same A-level grades as white students, even though they're not achieving the same level of two ones and firsts. So obviously that's such a big issue with systematic oppression, institutional racism, that isn't going to be fixed overnight. But I think by listening to people and making people feel like they're being actually heard and understood and they are valid at this university, I think that's a major step towards progress. Um, as you said, kind of listening to marginalised voices is obviously core to the role of women's officer. Um, so I think kind of one way that I would do it would be trying to hold bi-monthly focus groups with the representative committees that we've got on campus because obviously they understand their experiences and talking to people about that is the only way that we can feed into our work and make sure that all like people are represented on campus and feel safe and feel supported so I think talk obviously talking to people is the best way that kind of I'm or we as women's officers will be able to represent people so I think yeah keeping up that conversation and making sure that the campaigns that we run on campus aren't static they're not just like I've got the answers and I'm just going to run with it it's, it's about having these conversations with people and making sure that you know those experiences and those kind of I don't know, those people are represented, basically. Yeah, Grace got it in one. Talk to people. Um, again, one of my key points is I can't understand what everyone is going through, so I need people to tell me. I want to meet with the representative and the liberation committees on a regular basis. I want to hear what issues they're facing and what they think are the most important things to deal with. Because, like Rosa said, things aren't static. What's important at the start of the year might not be by Christmas or might be less so than another issue. And we need to be keeping up with that. It's a role really that's just, a mu uh, just as much about listening as it is about taking action. Um, so uh, Grace, you uh, have raised some issues over the mental health uh, services that are available to both BME and LGBT plus yeah. students and um, what do you identify as the issues with these and how would you go about sort of addressing them? Okay so I don't believe at the moment that the mental health service has the um, resources and the training to be able to understand how being for example a woman of colour or an LGBT plus individual how for example if you suffered some sort of trauma like sexual assault how that sexism and abuse is going to intersect with being, for example, a person of colour or part of another liberation group. Um, if I was to be women of, women's officer, I would really like to make it absolutely essential that all counsellors for the university health services had 
um, sensitivity training, so they understood kind of people's backgrounds more, what's going to affect how people are feeling in terms of like their cultural background or like their sexuality and just kind of understand who people are more and how different aspects of people's identities intersect with big issues that they're going to encounter as like a counsellor at the mental health service. What are the thoughts? Um, yeah, to follow that, like I completely agree with what you're saying and um, particularly in the LGBTQ plus community, um, their statistics are actually massively underrepresented um, with regards to health and sexual health because 19% of um, LGBTQ plus patients won't be actively out to their healthcare professional because they feel some like shame or embarrassed. They think that w they won't be understood, which means that they're not kind of getting the healthcare that they might need because they don't feel comfortable in their own health services. And I think that that, that is a massive problem. And we can definitely, as a university, try to make it better at our health service. And hopefully as well with my um, point about a sexual health awareness week. This is like massively one of the things I want to do is give a voice to underrepresented sexual communities. For example, sex and religion or LGBTQ plus and like other than heteronormative sex, hopefully getting people to be vocal and feel that they have a platform to speak about their sex. We can understand that their sexual health is just as important as normal sexual health. It feels sometimes um, with certain issues um, perhaps that we have set times on like the calendar that we really really listen to those issues and that for a lot of the the year or a lot of the time perhaps they aren't listened to as much so mm -hmm. like you're suggesting with um with this sort of awareness week um do we think that maybe like having more of these weeks is the answer or how do we need to change our behavior and practices to be able to make sure that these issues are being dealt with like all year round um i personally think that we've got a great infrastructure in place at uni with the personal tutor system. And I think if we can take that structure already and make it better, make it more easy for people to go and talk to the personal tutors and have more meaningful conversations. I think at the moment, contact hours with your personal tutor, um, I don't know about other people, but in my experience, hasn't been great. Um, it's been very difficult to actually get in contact with my tutor when I've had issues that aren't directly linked to like my deadlines or like education wise so I think if we can build upon that structure and work with what we already have at uni and just make it more effective make it more widely known and more importantly make people feel comfortable to go to their personal tutor with important issues. I think it's definitely important that we ensure that what we're not doing is simply dedicating a week's worth of activities to one group and then that's kind of it for the calendar year. And I think what we need to do, as I kind of mentioned before, is make sure that throughout the year these conversations are happening, there's workshops that are running, there are events that are taking place. So it's not just like, you know, we have one week's worth dedicated to BME students and then that's, that's it, do you know what I mean? Because it's not that's not realistic and it's not fair and what we need to do is include those kind of voices and conversations in all of the stuff that we do at university not just a kind of week's worth of activities i guess do you think that um <coughs> so obviously that i think is where the entire panel would like to get to where there's like it's we're constantly talking about it do you think sometimes particularly with sexual consent or sexual health there's not well i suppose there is a stigma but maybe like people feel uncomfortable starting to talk about it yeah um that's kind of, I know I completely agree with Rose's points that it can't just be a week and you have to keep the conversation going throughout and like just increase people's awareness. But I think that's the point of having a week. It's like a big, even if you want to avoid it, you want to avoid it, but it's going on at university and people who won't want to actively engage in workshops or like can, can avoid it if they want. People are talking about it and just making people feel more comfortable talking about things which are completely normal. Like, I think that is, so important just to show people that what they're experiencing is not they're not on their own and I think the reason why I think an awareness week is such a good thing like mental health awareness week we have it and it works it does work it's not like we have mental health awareness week and then we all go okay well now we're not going to talk about mental health anymore it just provides a big platform to people to be like look even if you don't want to listen just like look around your student union we're here for you we are supporting you and we need to talk about these issues so um, 
see women and the other liberation groups that the women's officer um, would be responsible for are uh, a disadvantaged or minority group. Um, Tambi, who I should mention actually can't be here today, um, she mentions like the misogyny and the patriarchy in her manifesto and I'm sure like everybody on this um, the panel, you know, feels about uh, feels in some way about those. How would you um, seek to tackle such massive issues in like a year of um, being in office? Like, what do you think are the steps that need to be taken? Um, I think one of the the big things is we need women to be represented in the curriculum and in the modules that we're taking. For example, I'm a sociology student. Last time we had a, a module which was 12 weeks long, 12 theorists, not a single one was a woman and not a single one what, um, theorist was a person of colour. So obviously if you're expecting women to feel included in uh, and, and liberation groups in um, university and then they're not actually being represented at the university and I don't really understand how we're I don't know how we're going to kind of build that bridge so I think one of the core things I would try and do is work with lots of different disciplines and ensure that module content and also guest lecturers and lecturers are representing the students that we have at the university because I think without that then we, yeah we're going to struggle to to break down the kind of like the misogyny that's embedded in a lot of our society. Does that come into decolonising the curriculum? Yeah, 100%. Um, obviously, like decolonising the curriculum is something that Maid has been working very closely with the past semester or so. Um, the university have just launched their BAME strategy, which is fantastic that they're kind of making efforts to bring about this change. I think um, sexism at uni and like institutional racism is never going to be like solved in a day. It is a long process, and arguably there's nothing that we could do in a year that would you know, eradicate all oppression. But I think one really solid idea is to take the project week that we do in first year, Think Create, or it has a few other different names, and use that as a way to expose students to um, the work of like women in academia, BME people in academia, LGBT plus, um, disabled, like there are so many different areas that we could compulsory like expose students to mm. by putting them in diverse groups and giving them a week to just explore on their own. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, sorry, did you have something to say? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just going to mention that um, as we've been discussing, you know, women in the university, I think one really good idea would be to reach out to the women who work at our university, lecturers and academics, who are all obviously successful and strong women, especially in my department, is molecular biology and biotechnology. We have a massive active research department with loads of female researchers and I feel like we could reach out to them as a student union and say please may you speak to our students show us how we can be successful make women feel empowered by the women that are in our university and perhaps aren't seen um, if you don't go to your lectures or you don't have a female tutor or you don't know but there are so many successful women within the university who we can reach out to and inspire our students with. Sarah, would you agree on like that sort of strategy for t trying to tackle these big issues like that are embedded in our society? Yeah, I mean, there are so many ways you can go about this because it's such a big issue. I definitely think that making um, some aspects compulsory where everyone works together in diverse groups is an amazing way to make sure everyone's eyes are open. And part of what I talk about in my manifesto is also about celebrating current women's successes. That can be our students, but also, like Cara says, highlight the women that work in our university because we have so many amazing minds and it is a problem in the sciences because so many of our women scientists are hidden behind closed doors. No one knows they're there and they deserve recognition. So that would definitely be beneficial if we could have sort of a platform to showcase their excellence. Um, one thing that you identify in your manifesto, Rosa, is period poverty, mm -hmm. which it comes under this, um, it's in this vein. Um, how would you go about sort of tackling that in the SU? Um, so one of the ideas I had was something called a P card, which works similarly to a C card, which is essentially where a student gets a card in which they can go to the SU shop or the, off, um, like the desk at Enclif and have access to free sanitary products. And given that the university's turnover at the, moment, at the moment is in the millions, I feel like we definitely have it in our resources to be able to support and provide for students who need sanitary products. And I don't, yeah, I don't see why that, that 
which you know isn't the case at the moment. And I did a lot of work for an organisation called Plan UK, and we did a big project about ending stigma and also exploring the effects that period poverty have on students and the statistics on the amount of students that miss out on kind of their education because of just have the lack of basic necessities like sanitary products is really, really shameful. And I think as a university, like we should not stand for that. And there are definitely easy like, initiatives that we can put in place which, which can combat it. Um, I also think like y what you're saying is amazing. And I didn't put it in my manifesto about period poverty, but when we had our radio roundtables, you actually like made me think about it a lot. And I think another thing that we could do, along with Rose's idea, is we're in a zero waste shop, we sell moon cups, yeah. and we sell them for a lot cheaper than they sell them in boots. And this is such a good alternative to standard period products because they last for five years. It's a one-time purchase, 14 pounds, and then it lasts for five years. So we can promote that or perhaps provide it for free for students who require it and they maybe get bursaries or something like that. And it also, um, the moon cup is a really good option for trans men. So female to male transition, they might feel like dysmorphic about their, the fact that they have a period. And if they identify as male and they go in the male bathrooms, there's no sanitary bins. So I think promoting the moon cup as an SU would be very like beneficial to us as well. Yeah, I have like quite a big personal focus on sustainability. And so this was something I thought of as well, because there's so much funding for condoms, there is so much funding for sexual health test kits. And I mean, I know it's not enough. It's never gonna be enough, but there's a lot there. And there are a lot of companies that do freebie giveaways in Freshers Week. And a lot of these sanitary product companies work with the NUS to offer samples. So there, that could also sort of be diverted into just providing reusable sanitary products to women at the start of their university career because as Cara said, it's a very small financial investment that can make such a difference to people's education. No, I definitely agree. I think there's, um, if we bring in like black and minority ethnic um, cultures into this as well, in the kind of South Asian, East Asian cultures, periods are very, very stigmatized, very, very heavily stigmatized. And I think um, there isn't a very like vocal discussion going on about it between like communities, between cultures, and I think implementing a structure into the university where it was just out in the open, in toilets, you know, in the union, it would definitely create, you know, a really good discourse about it. Do we think like sometimes, I don't know, because you mentioned condoms and it feels like, you know, condoms are, are dished out, you know, at all of the sort of major events and, and it, does sometimes it feel that it feel like people, feel that uh, a, uh, an issue is already dealt with by doing like they do like one thing and it's like we'll dish out loads of condoms and then actually like sometimes the focus doesn't expand it just sort of ends and and you know if, if that's the case like what what are the strategies for a women's officer to try and like ensure that when the university or SU does something really really good they continue to do good and expand those uh, those schemes I think that's, yeah, you've made a very, very valid point there because I feel like a lot of what we're touching on has been, to some extent, addressed by previous women's office, officers. And I think the important thing that we do is we keep up that the momentum and make sure that initiatives that have been put in place before don't then just end in September, well, July or whatever, whenever the kind of academic year ends. Because what we need to do is kind of pick up from what from previous people have done and then continue that. And I think we, yeah, if we have good briefings and we collaborate with other officers, I feel like there should be no issue with us kind of keeping up that momentum and keeping the conversation going. Yeah, I completely agree. And also, as we've said so many times for an absolute key part of our role is communication with the students. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we stay in communication with the students as much as we can, keep hearing what they need, we keep telling them what we're trying to do to help them. I think that will be the best way we can serve our students. Because <laughs> it's tough, right? Because you're only in the role for a year. And like, as we've seen from, you know, the, the discussions that we've had, that there are such like monumental issues that need to be tackled. Like, is it about sort of carrying on like what previous officers have done and really just trying to keep that momentum going? Um, I definitely think it's about working with what we already have because obviously like implementing something completely new is going to take a lot of funding, it's going to take a long process. So I think kind of appreciating what we have at the uni already and 
kind of expanding on it and also kind of just stressing the importance and why it was there in the first place. I think it's easy for it to lose its meaning and people like giving out condoms, it's very easy to just kind of accept that as just part of what you're going to get handed out at Freshers. I think it's very important to not lose sight of why we do the things we do and kind of expand and try and get more funding for things. I think it's hard sometimes as kind of like a minority or like a liberation group to get people to listen to what you're trying to say and kind of get people to believe that what you're saying is valid and it's important and there's proof that it's important. Final thoughts, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a balance because if you have a new idea, it's important to present it to your groups, your council, the other officers, and to begin discourse because it can take a long time to build up to, but we can't just assume that because an officer has tackled it this year, last year, that it's dealt with because that's not the case, mm. especially with things that interact with the university itself, not just union proceedings. I feel like there is a bit of a lack of respect in some departments for the union and the officers. So I think it will be very important to keep a check on things like that. I am mostly referring to like Maida's sexual harassment mm -hmm. sort of framework that she set up this year because so much work has gone into that and I feel if the eyes were taken off the university for five minutes, that would be out of the way and that would be such a shame. So present new ideas but definitely keep building on what we've got because so much effort has been spent there. Well, thank you all so much. We're just about out of time now for um, the debate between candidates for women's officer. If ever you needed reminding uh, what a vital role uh, women's officer is, I think this debate has proven that. Um, so keep your eye on all of the elections coverage uh, so that you know your vote. Uh, and we're throwing back to David in the studio. Cheers. Thank you, Cameron. Well, that was a great debate, wasn't it, Kate? Very yeah. civilised. Um, were there any standout performers for you? Um, for me, it was a mixture of, I think, Cara and uh, Rosa were the two that seemed to have the most kind of um, thought out plans, really. OK, we'll go into why a little bit later on, but we'll start at the beginning of the debate. And something that was sort of a consistent theme throughout is the idea of sexual consent and their policies towards that. Mm. Now, a point that was brought up was the lack of consent uh, that can affect different types of women. So maybe LGBT women, BME women. What do you think can be done to highlight this issue and to tackle it moving forward? Well, they were discussing different ways of providing that extra support. Um, quite a lot of them were focusing actually on the existing system and how it can be improved on that. Um, I believe it was uh, Cara who said that she was already involved in the current consent training model and was aware, because she has previously been an ambassador for that, that that was something that she herself was aware of existed and actually she, that was something she was looking to improve further, um, which was interesting having that inside knowledge there. Um, otherwise, um, I believe it was Grace who was talking about uh, the existing pastoral system and about... Um, those tutors who are already providing that and how they can provide serve, further support possibly. Mm, um, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, no, carry on with you. Uh, so yeah, the, the idea of the tutor support I think is a great idea, but at least in my experience, academic tutors aren't necessarily pastorally trained mm. to be dealing with serious issues like that. And you obviously want someone to have the training to be able to deal with you appropriately. Do you think it's feasible financially to be able to train every single university mentor to be able to deal with pastoral issues or do you think it's better to have a designated set of people i think ultimately yeah a, a designated set of people i just don't see how it's possible i think a lot of tutors struggle to even meet a lot of um their own tutees in an academic capacity let alone providing that further service and actually having a team of people means that you have multiple people that you might feel comfortable going to whereas on a one-to-one -one system you might actually not feel that comfortable going to your tutor in that capacity or there's certain information that you might want to keep your academic um life separate to your personal life mm -hmm. and that will be blurring those two provisions that actually, um, for many people, I imagine they would want to keep separate, really. Mm. And uh, Cara mentioned having consent talks for first years. Now, mm -hmm. I, in my first year, uh, I had a group come into my flat in Encliff and talk about sexual consent. And it was perhaps a little bit awkward, wasn't maybe as smoothly done as it could have been. Mm. Now, I think the idea of having lectures outlining the importance of sexual consent is a great idea. However, there are a lot of first year students, I'm not sure on the exact number, but it's going to be in the thousands. Mm. That's a lot of lectures. Yeah, and also the way about doing that, I mean, obviously we all at the start of when we first started in first year, we 
are mixed um, together to have a one big mass talk in the octagon. Mm -hmm. But the nature of something such personal, um, and well, not even personal, but just such a sensitive topic can actually be more effective in smaller groups but again that's even more difficult if we were to even cut it down and actually make it like almost seminar style groups that's just very difficult and actually in terms of also ensuring that everyone and particularly those who might need it most come along that's something that really can't be measured uh, like in terms of as you say when you were in Encliffe and um, having that provision my as a first year student at Ranmore we were actually given the option to go and a lot of people weren't actually avail around for the talks and therefore majority of me including myself and my flatmates didn't actually receive any information to do with um, sexual um, awareness sexual health so I, I just see that as being very difficult to carry out as a as a provision really mm. and a great stat was brought up 63 percent of women from 150 universities will experience sexual harassment in some capacity whilst at university but only six percent will report it using the disclosure form now we were discussing we don't even know where that mm. disclosure form is so that is correct that i think bringing attention to that disclosure form and trying to find that is an important issue but i think also you have to consider kate that Sometimes it's going to be abuse from non-university students mm. just out in Sheffield and there's not a lot the office can, officers can do about that really. No, I mean currently the system with that I believe is just in terms of contacting with the police. I'm sure there is existing people who can provide that kind of emotional or guidance support but ultimately that does become a police matter and that's where you'll be taken to for those types of issues really. Mm. And uh, there was also talk about mental health and um, women's sanitary products as well. Rosa mm -hmm. mentioned the idea of a P card. Mm -hmm. Now, the discussion was had that some toilets in the university already have sanitary products yes, stocked yeah. in there. And also the idea of the moon cup was brought up as well. Mm -hmm. 14 pounds and it lasts five years. It's more environmental and sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's good back and forth there, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a really interesting discussion, actually. I was I had a lot of um, existing thoughts already about how they were actually going to suggest, because in their manifestos they suggested this but didn't actually outline how they were going to do it. Um, I tend to agree with Cara, actually, in terms of looking for a sustainable solution um, in terms of the moon cups. Though I did, and also that she focused on which group should actually be provided it in terms of bursary students, because ultimately not all female and um, as she focused on trans students um, also would be an excellent solution for them um, but not all people will need these products and um, yeah and that's essentially that focus I think shows that kind of a little bit of extra thought that she's put into it possibly over um, Cara there mm. I mean over um, Rosa there yeah and I think a great quote to sum up that debate would be you are not on your own and uh, we're gonna be heading over now to the education officer debate and I'm gonna hand you over to Cameron now Cheers, David. Uh, we're back for the second debate on the second night of Forge Debates for the 2019 SU elections. Uh, cheers, everyone, for coming down. Uh, candidates for Education Officer, how are we all? Good, thank Good. you. Yeah, cheers. Okay, thank you. Not bad? Yeah. Coping. Good. So, straight into it. Um, obviously, there's a, a big thing for Education Officers, is, um, or candidates for Education Officers, is to um, the want to lobby the government for stuff like free tuition fees, the reintroduction of the maintenance grant. Um, how do you feel as the SU education officer like you'd be in the best position to to lobby the government and try and change government policy, Charlie? Well, I've had many years experience in campaigning for free education from organizing national demonstrations to more local things as well. But I'd bring this experience with me to support other uh, activists on the ground who are fighting for free education and also support, uh, well, the Best way, best way to get a get free education is to lobby for a labor well, to campaign for a labor government who promised for education in their manifesto. But I'd also challenge marketization on Sheffield locally. My cut the rent policy is to uh, challenge the increasing costs of rent and the increasing privatization of services in uh, universities. And I would like to see that challenge more immediately. Ben? Uh, well, obviously I do. My principle is that I believe in free education. I've always believed in that, and I will always believe in that. But I think I'm more realistic, and I don't think that it's my job to say, oh, we'll have free education in a year, because people have done that, and I don't think it's, I think it's a bit disingenuous for me to say that. But what I will do is I'll make Sheffield the voice of South Yorkshire, well, actually the whole of Yorkshire, by talking to other issues around the, around the county. Because if we're talking as a county, we've got more influence on what politicians down in London think than if it's just one issue saying, oh, we believe this. But if, we've, if we can talk the whole, you know, biggest county in the country saying, oh, no, we don't want tuition fees and we want maintenance grants instead. Might not happen in a year, but two, three years down the line, I think it's a bit more realistic. I'm sorry, Ben, but I kind of disagree there. First of all, 
for me, free education is, not, is both a principle and a aim. So it's a principle because I want to see an education system that is for accessible for everyone, but it's also an aim in concrete policies. So I think it's a bit unfair to say that we're being disingenuous by promising free education in the year. Well, I think I just think my priority should be on the policies that I've got, like like tackling hidden costs that will impact our students from September onwards. I don't think our students want to see me going down to London twice a year to campaign in a march that won't change anything. But if I can do something that impacts their lives straight away on the ground, surely that's better for them. Um, you mentioned hidden costs there, Charlie. You also mentioned hidden costs in your um, manifesto in the you want to bring in a materials grant. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, uh, so the, the materials grant, um, lots and lots of universities have them already. Um, it's basically just a, a grant that um, it, can, it works on all sorts of different bases, but generally students on a, who ha from lower income backgrounds and stuff like that um, are entitled to a grant that goes towards covering um, materials essential for their course. So whether this is printing, course, course uh, files, um, uh, core books for the module, um, all sorts of materials that might be needed. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a way of um, cutting down those hidden costs that you might not be expecting when you come into university. And um, it offers quite a lot of um, freedom in terms of how, how well, what in one sense, how the students, what they do with, with it, how they ch choose to um, uh, use the money and what, what sort of facilities it goes towards but it can also be tailored by departments um, so that it, it can sort of be like su some departments more, you're gonna need to buy more materials than others. Um, and so there's that sort of freedom to uh, um, tailor it in, in that respect. Um, Jazz, how about you in terms of, uh, obviously lots of candidates for education officer do focus on or mention free tuition fees and the reintroduction of maintenance grants. How, how would you feel about that and trying to influence government policy? Uh, so I think I agree with Ben on this point that it's less feasible to accomplish this in one year. I think I'm really good at lobbying um, uh, departments and getting staff and students to collaborate so I can really get a united force um, on any of these policies, but I would not be able to completely get rid of tuition fees in one year. So I can start a movement um, and get support from other universities, but um, that's kind of that's where I stand on that. Back to um, hidden costs very quickly. Um, both your ideas, Ben and Charlie, um, are obviously going to cost. A Sam, excuse me, that is Charlie. Your Sam. Um, Sorry. I, no, I apologise. Um, Sam and Ben, uh, both of your policies are um, obviously going to cost some money. Where would you intend to get that money from? Start with Ben with your £5 free cr printer cool. credit. So yeah, I don't envision the SU paying for this. I don't think that'd be fair. I'm not sure we've got the money for it. I envision the uni paying for that. Cause it, part of it, it is part of dis starting the discussion on hidden costs and telling the uni we need a bit more support. We can't, you know, we, we pay our nine grand, we come here, and then we have to pay for textbooks, equipment, anything else. So I, I envision the uni paying for it. It would cost, I think I've worked out about 150 grand, which, as Charlie has pointed out in his, in his everything, really, that the uni has quite a lot of money going spare. I think, it's it, I think it'd be right. Day one, go tell them, look, you've got all this money going spare. How about we, we use some of it not on investments, but on just giving students £5 free print credit every year and not just a slightly degree. But on that, the university does have a surplus last year of 20, 24 and a half million pounds whilst not just printing and kind of other hidden costs associated with going to university are not covered by the university. We're also seeing departments being horrendously under, underserviced by the, by the university. So uh, languages in particular are seeing underfunding to the tune of around a million pound deficit because they're struggling to recruit due to outside factors largely, not because it isn't a brilliant, de brilliant department and brilliant uh, faculty un un which they're in. But I think we need to see a student union that is willing to, first of all, say that languages are being cut massively, and second of all, willing to do something about this. He literally has his name written in massive letters on his T-shirt. I know, I got you two confused. <laughs> that, that was your badge, to it's, be fair. It's quite yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> um, 
Well, um, the education officer, you've just touched on it there, Charlie, um, works, has to work closely with the university. You um, will have to work closely with the university and try and get the uni to change its practices and behaviours. Um, how do you all feel about trying to do that? Jazz, you um, want to lobby departments to have a head of pastoral care. Um, how might you go about trying to lobby the university to implement this? Um, so I already have a lot of connections in different departments. Uh, my work towards um, kind of running, helping run the academic rep system means that I've had a lot of contact with key members of staff. So I already have people that know I, the work I do, that I'm really good at getting things done uh, and that already support me. So I'd start with the people that know me um, and kind of say, look, this is something we really need. I'd use examples from other departments where it's worked. We brought it in in chemistry last year and it's been so useful. I've accessed the service myself. Uh, I felt so much more supported because of it. And actually we can now signpost uh, from personal tutors to this head of pastoral care. Um, it means that there's a way of bringing up personal tutors um, on their practice if they're not being as supportive as they should be or if there are more training requirements needed. Is sort of the key to lobby in the university like showing positive examples of where those sorts of things have worked in the past? Yeah, I think particularly with, uh, with pastoral care, uh, best practice is exactly what needs to be copied. But also we need to recognize that a lot of departments don't have the funding to do this. So Jazz's own department, Chemistry, is one of the departments that is simultaneously being underfunded and not being able to replace staff that when they quit. So essentially, <laughs> I want to see money go into these support services in tangible material funds, which is the most important thing that before being, being able to uh, offer these new services, which but I do fully support the idea <laughs> of uh, pastoral care. Ben? Can I just interrupt there and say that actually in chemistry we didn't have to put any more funds in. We just reallocated the personal tutees to different members of staff so one member would be free to manage everybody. So your um, idea of a head of, a head of pastoral care would be an existing member of staff? Absolutely, because they have the best knowledge of the department. Uh, yeah, that's fair if it works. I, just, I do worry about increased workloads members members of staff and take on extra duties, but if it can be if it can be worked, that's that's great. But I'm not sure it can in every department. Uh, ben, I feel you had something to say. Um, I might have done. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, I asked about <laughs> uh, lobbying the university and trying to get the university to change its behaviours and practices, and how you feel about being able to do that. Um, yeah, I think part of it is just working with the university where we can. A lot of mine, my ideas, sort of are disabled students or yeah about the assessment methods will be done by working with individual departments rather than just talking to the big university as a whole. It's about doing that, then talking to faculties, then talking to departments, and seeing how we, how we can help them change on an individual level, not just saying, like, as one, you should be doing this as, you know, as absolute standard. Work with each department to see what they can provide, what resources they have, and how we can work with them to achieve my aims. Sam? That's your correct name this time. It is. Um, <laughs> you, one of the ways that students have voices in their departments is through the academic rep system, mm -hmm. which you've identified having some issues. Could you talk us yeah. through a little bit the issues that you feel that there are with those? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I actually, I think um, Anna's done a really great job implementing it so far. As, sorry. <laughs> well done. Um, Anna's in the audience today. Yeah, sorry, I missed you there. Um, sorry, that's... that's um, so yeah, I, I think I think it is like get going in a really good direction. Um, one of the things I'd like to see is um, uh, for for there to be more uh, students uh, in who are on access courses through departments like the uh, Department of Lifelong Learning um, represented in there. Um, I think that this that department's really really important because it's uh, it's people who have um like maybe maybe don't have a levels maybe don't have uh, the same like access and privileges that uh, most of us come to university with um and so there's there's really a, quite a unique voice there that i think needs to be heard if we're going to make education more accessible and inclusive um and so yeah, I, I actually I came through that department my, myself, um, which is what I, I, I feel like I know how it works. And I know that a concern for a lot of the students there is that then, there's a, like within that department, everything works really well, but there's a disconnect from the departments that they go into after the access course. And so encouraging 
better links with, with these students through the academic rep, rep system is like a really important thing, I think, um, and uh, there's a lot to be gained from that. Um, ben, how might sort of the idea of representation and accessibility feed into your uh, policies about disabled students? I'm interested to hear a little bit about what those policies are. Um, I think my sales, I think my sales students policy is more focused on students who are already here and especially who will be arriving in September. So it's more about working with each department to, in theory, produce a leaflet it's tailored to each department about the services available to their students and you know how to access them when they're available, things like that. And then, more importantly, this is probably more of a long-term aim, but hopefully still achieved by next year, make sure that each student, well, disabled student, has one meeting a semester at least about their learning support plan. Because I know a lot of disabled students, I know some departments are really good at the way they are with their disabled students. They're really helpful, really make them feel welcome, and that's fantastic. But I just think it would be worthwhile if every department had, was like that with, you know, more detail about the services that are available, making sure there's more support for their, for their students. And obviously, if we've got good disabled student services here, which you're or even better than, than we already have, I should say, then, you know, hopefully disabled students feel more welcome and willing to come here. I guess we come back to this issue again of like trying to affect change in the university. Like how easy or hard do you feel that it will be as education officer in the students' union to influence change? I think uh, influencing change on a university basis is can only be done, first of all, by working in solidarity with staff and workers, because the university is staff and students. It's not management or the buildings, or it is about the learning, the teaching, the research that goes on. First, so first of all, I work with the campus trade unions, who are the representatives of staff, through our students' union representatives of students, but I'd also encourage grassroots movements to push for what they want to see, what, what sort of university they would like to see. And if you look at uh, UCL, uh, where they had a brilliant mental health campaign that secured extra funding, reducing their wait lists. Uh, and similarly at UCL, uh, as well as Sussex, they had uh, rent campaigns which reduced the rents uh, to levels which in much more expensive cities than Sheffield, uh, so Brighton and London, they now have cheaper rents. So I would support grassroots campaigns to campaign for university that, that they want. That they want. Yeah, I think Charlie's spot on there. Um, I think another thing that is worth thinking about is um, the importance of uh, our PhD students in this, because obviously they're, sort of, they're doing a lot of teaching now, they're, they're responsible for really a lot, um, and they will be in the more se moving into the more senior positions going forward. Um, so sort of starting off by supporting and building really good relationships with our PhD students, I think, is another important point. Yeah, and th thank you, first of all, Sam. But also, PhD students are obviously both students and workers and occupy this position, which um, is they are facing the brunt of a lot of uh, changes to our education system. So a lot of uh, PhD students do huge amounts of teaching but are on precarious contracts, um, so are constantly having to look for new jobs. They don't know whether they'll be living in a year's time or nine months' time, let alone you know, having any of the job security that uh, used to be afforded to, to people doing teaching in universities. But uh, on top of that, they, uh, the gender pay gap is increasing and the uh, workloads are increasing with uh, university lecturers you know, having horrendous, horrendous times <laughs> ahead of them, which needs to be stopped because their working conditions are our learning conditions. You mentioned, sort of you touched upon it then, but you mentioned explicitly earlier student staff solidarity. This time last year, of course, um, s certain members of staff were striking over um, their pensions and the sort of uncertainty or the threats to have their pensions cut. Um, we saw a lot of student staff solidarity last year. Um, uh, like it's undeniable. But some students sometimes feel or might struggle to sustain the, their support for this sort of strike action uh, when it comes to like their assessments or their teaching being disrupted, like lots of people, because it was around this time of year, were working on dissertations, for example. Um, and obviously home and international students, international students more so than home students, pay so much money for their degrees year on year. Um, do you, first of all, feel that it's like appropriate for the education officer to prioritise supporting staff over students? I don't think it's staff or students, first of all. Uh, it's staff and students in the university. Both staff and students are the ones who are facing 
horrendous attacks to their working conditions, to learning conditions, and as PhD, stu PhD students are both staff and students, and are, should be represented by their students' union. Uh, another thing, disruption from strikes is uh, nothing compared to the continued disruption to our education from uh, awful working conditions. Uh, so people, you know, what, yeah, just that. And finally, international students, um, yes, do face particular challenges when it comes to strike action. In particular, they have to sign in uh, and sh pr show that they're getting a certain amount of education uh, for visa reasons. Same with international staff, have to show that they're doing a certain amount of work for visa reasons. But the Students' Union and the UCU, during the strike, work together to guarantee the rights of international students and international staff to uh, not only go on strike, but also to stand in solidarity with the striking workers. And I don't think it's uh, right to say that prioritizing either staff or students is uh, what's going on here. It's actually prioritizing education. I think the reason that staff and students are being pitted against each other so often is because of the marketization of education and that actually students are being seen more often as customers and staff as uh, customer service. And this is completely wrong and we need to challenge this. Make sure students are aware of the staff point of view and vice versa. Um, last year I did support a strike, obviously I voted for it when it came, well I voted for the SU to support it when it came to SU Council. I do believe that it was the right thing for the SU to do to support it. But I know from experience that I did lose an assessment because of that, which I didn't think was fantastic. I still had like six more in that module, so it was okay, I recovered my grades. But I know some people, and obviously with the snow as well, that wasn't superb. But I think primarily we should focus on our students, and like you say, PhD students, our staff as well. But I think prim our priority should be the students we have here. But where we can work with the staff and the UCU and the campus trade unions we've got, then I think we should be doing that as long as it's not to the detriment of our students' education. Sorry, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 my memories of last year, um, I, I know uh, the, the strikes which obviously I assume we will support here, um, uh, re did impact on a lot of students' mental health, uh, particularly international students. Um, I know particularly, I think, in the architecture department, it coincided with a particular hand aid day, and that there was, you know, people having genuine panic attacks and stuff over this. And so whilst it is obviously important that we show solidarity and all this sort of stuff. I, I think the I think as as education officer, it's it's some it would be important to think about um, like going forward, like that there needs to be mental health support for for those periods going forwards. What assurances as education officer, if we were to be in a similar situation and mm -hmm. the SU were to like support the strike as we did, um, what would assurances would you give to our students? Um, so actually there's a, one of the things that I don't feel are re really being made much use of at the moment is there's fantastic, fantastic facility, like local f mental health facilities all around Sheffield that are currently sort of quite separate from the university itself. Um, Sheffield Flourish, for instance, um, who I've done a lot of work with, have a fantastic um, like app that's sort of like a, a Sheffield mental health guide, and it sort of signposts you to all these fantastic services. I think there's so much to, that could be gained by developing closer links with these sort of lo local mental health services, both in terms of being able to provide a w wider range of coverage to students and also in terms of what we can offer them in terms of sort of, um, uh, I mean, the, the English department, which I come from already, we already sort of have modules and stuff where we, we go and sort of uh, run narrative workshops and stuff like that as part. So there's. There's really a lot to be gained in both parties through stuff like that. What assurances might, Ben, you give? Um, I think one thing I'd want to do as education officer is be very clear that I am open and anyone can talk to me. Like, I like to pride myself on being quite approachable, just as a person in life. I'd like to think that as education officer, especially in periods like that when people are worried about whether assessments are happening, whether or not, whether or not to go in for lectures, etc. 
that I'd like to think that I'd be open, that they could always come talk to me in that office or drop me a message on Facebook, send me an email, so I could sort of talk to them about their st situation specifically, and then maybe if I had to go talk to the department about how, you know, how we can work with them to ensure that, that student's concerns have been addressed even during strike periods. I think if the strike showed anything, it showed that f uh, funding is a political choice, not an economic necessity. It showed that the money was there to keep the uh, defined benefit pension that they were striking for. Um, it's, still, it's still in place to this day, one year on the one year anniversary of the strike. So, uh, happy birthday. Um, also, a 28 degree difference in temperature approximately is <laughs> a great sign between a year. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it proved that, that the strikes last year showed that funding is a political choice and mental health issues caused by the strike were real. And if any of those, any of those students tried to access university uh, health service, they'll have known that they, uh, well, they might, they might be in there now, unfortunately, because the brilliant professionals who are there uh, are massively under-resourced. And the strike showed that if we pressure the university into giving students and staff what they need, which is mental health funding, beyond first, first and foremost, then, um, yeah, as well, essentially, it can, it can happen. And just. I think it also showed how we can really utilize the rep system. So in my own department, uh, I worked with the staff that were actually left working. So our head of department stayed in, wasn't striking. Um, I obviously was supporting the strikers, but kind of filled in for them while they weren't there, talking to students, kind of communicating issues back to them to make sure everyone was up to date. I think this is a really important thing, like keeping the communication channels open and really utilizing those points. Sorry, I, I'm really sorry, but support <laughs> supporting scabs is not supporting the strike. Like supporting the strike is supporting students outside of the departments. People crossing picket lines is not supporting the strike. I didn't have to be in the department to communicate with the lecturers, and I was on most of the picket lines with my lecturers. Yeah, but working with the strike with non-striking staff isn't supporting the strike. Well, both Ben um, and Jazz bring up study spaces before we talk about the strikes from last year all night. Um, what issues do you both feel that there are over study spaces? And, and Ben, what exactly is a priority booking system? So priority booking essentially is all these rooms in buildings like Pamela Visage that are there now, you could go and sit in them now, that have loads of computers, things like that, that no one knows about. They all think that the uh, IC, down, only place you can go to study. My priority booking would be nine to five during exam times just make sure that's earmarked for us as students that we can go there and make sure that we study, that we can study, sorry. So you're not having to get up at 7 a.m. to go find a seat in the IC that might not have a computer or it might, not be, it might be missing a mouse or a keyboard. You can go get up a bit later, you can have a full night's sleep. It's better for your welfare, I think it's better for your grades. And fun fundamentally, you know, I think that's just, we should be using those spaces and, at most point, advertising them properly because most people don't know about them. So make sure they're out for us and make sure people know they're there. Jazz, is that similar to your strategy or different to your strategy? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? So um, both of you identify study spaces and all the lack of study spaces being an issue. Like, How would you go about sort of tackling that issue? Um, so I, th I think I made it quite clear in my manifesto that I would um, kind of talk to departments um, about using the empty lecture theatres and seminar rooms as study space. I know this has worked in the maths department before, but they didn't publicise it quite as well. Um, so obviously I'd want to really raise um, awareness of that so that it could be fully utilised. But actually there are about 30,000 students in our university and the capacity of the libraries is only roughly 1,000 each. Uh, so there really is need for that study space. Any other thoughts on study spaces? Yeah, essentially Jazz is entirely right on that. Like the library services are set up for, uh, well, we're bo all built when the student numbers were limited and the delimiting of student numbers with the marketization of higher education has meant that universities are recruiting and recruiting and recruiting as much as they can without guaranteeing the services are provided like study spaces, particularly for libraries. Yeah, I'm with Chas. Great, so um, obviously with regards to being an education officer, there are like so many, there are just, well, I guess it's the same with all officers, there are all manner of issues that you have to tackle. Where do you sort of set your priorities and where, who, where will students who vote for you see change? Uh, I think, so this is basically what am I going to do from day one, do you think? Basically. Cool. So I think day one I'd come in, I think the ones I want to do first are the ones that could be in place hopefully by September for the next cohort of students. So for me I think that'd be the £5 free printer credit, because obviously the uni's already got the money, as Charlie has willingly pointed out. 
Um, uni's already got the money, so I think we could just go to them first day and start working with them on how that could be distributed to students. And you know, by September, if we've got two or three months, I think that's doable. And um, and the disabled students one. So again, for the new cohort of students, so we can because it's going to be a lot of work to work with all of the departments and on producing those leaflets. But I think it's worth it for such a for such an important cause. Charlie. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I'd utilise the campaigns that already exist and give them the support that they need to be able to do the work, the brilliant work they're doing. So uh, I know there's a campaign for in the languages department at the moment to save the language, uh, save languages and cultures in Sheffield, which I would be give it off the institutional support they need. But um, also, yeah, well, student work, students work, work solidarity again is ongoing, um, but it, it needs to be institutionalised and it already, it already is, but it's much bigger scale, I think. And finally, uh, uh, yeah, and stop cuts to courses and services is an immediate issue. And again, like Ben, I think I would prioritise uh, getting that in place for the new students who are coming in in September. But also, uh, use, if, it, if it can't happen, then uh, using the academic, academic reps to uh, implement it. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's not been addressed yet is... Um, the potential effects Brexit could have, um, which you know could be absolutely catastrophic. Nobody really knows. Um, but come the 29th of March, you know, it's um, we don't know what's going to happen to uh, the existing research contracts, international students, students on on trips around the world. You know, um, so for me, that that was like providing the support necessary to students, being a liaison between. The uh, the university staff who are working tirelessly to sort of work out what's going to happen with that and students that that would be uh, one of my priorities definitely. And Jazz, finally, I think uh, my priorities would definitely lie with widening participation. So there's a lot of emphasis on getting students from uh, different backgrounds into university. For example, uh, low economic backgrounds, um, uh, LGBT plus, uh, black and ethnic minority, disabled students. Um, and I think there's not enough uh, support in place to kind of keep them here. So we have a lot of students that drop out. Um, mental health is a really big issue. Um, so my biggest priority would be getting those uh, support routes in place for these incoming lot of students. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining me here for the second debate of night two of Forge Debates. Uh, back to David in the studio. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Now, I'm joined alongside Luke Baldwin and Jack Matlis. That was a lot more intense debate. A lot of things were said. But we're going to start with tuition fees. Now, Ben said he would be campaigning for free education and get some support across Yorkshire. Now, he might have the support in Yorkshire, but do you think he can get the support across the country, Jack? I mean, I hope he can, and it's a good thing to work towards. But I think we've got to be realistic here. And, you know, the only way that the tuition fee situation is going to change is if there's a change of national government. And, you know, the current situation, um, that might happen quite soon. Um, but, but I think, you know, we need to kind of rein back a bit and, and appreciate that, realistically, the only way that that change is going to come about is if there's a change of administration. And Luke, the policy was called disingenuous. Do you agree with that? Um, I would say that Charlie's approach to it was disingenuous. I think Ben had a, a really good pragmatism to sort of his approach. He, you know, he accepted that this is my principle, this is what I stand for. However, realistically, can I implement this in a year? Probably not. I think my focus should be elsewhere on, on realistic goals. Um, like I said, Charlie, on the other hand, seems to have the whole, it's a principle and an aim, I think is, for want of a better word, nonsense. And I think it's one that we've heard a lot over the past three or four years in elections. So... You know, in an ideal world, I would love it if we had free education. It would sort my bank, out, bank account out massively, and I wish I didn't have a load of debt. Realistically, will an education officer change that? No. So I don't think it should be talked about. Okay, now that brings up an interesting point that was talked about, whether you should implement a policy that will last longer than your legacy as an officer, or should you just focus on the one year you have, Jack? You can do both, right? You, c you can have long-term goals that kind of stretch across successive years. You can take up the legacy of the last officer and leave your own legacy, and you can also work on one-year projects. So I don't think they're two things that can't be reconciled. You can do both in conjunction, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Luke, another big topic was hidden costs. Now, it was talked about how the university has a profit of £24.5 million in surplus, and Ben's idea of £5 printing would only cost £150,000. Do you think that's worth spending money on? Yeah, absolutely. It's a real problem for you know average students. A lot of people have problems with printing costs. Um, 
and yeah, it's it's a relatively cheap thing to implement. So yeah, I think it's a really good idea, and I think it's a really good job that you brought it up. I think that's what the focus should be on. Back to the previous point on real problems that can be solved rather than these huge hypothetical situations. Okay, and Jazz mentioned about pastoral care, and the issue came up with Charlie whether the chemistry department or university departments as a whole would have the funding. Jack, do you think, A, there will be the funding, B, the workload, and C, it's a realistic policy? Well, the university is running a surplus, so there's, there's clearly the funding. Um, I'm just a bit curious over, over quite what they're getting at here, because I know in my department, we all have personal tutors, and then above personal tutors, there's a member of academic staff assigned to, to look over the year group um, pastorally. So I'm not quite sure what this new role would add to that. So that's still where my questions are on that. No. Luke, in the departments I have experienced, and I mentioned it earlier, academic, not academic, sorry, the mentors are not pastorally trained. Do you think that's going to be an issue? I think for me personally, I've, I've, I'm fortunate enough to have done two different courses because I quit the first one, but the disparity between the first one compared to the second one and how well um, personal tutors treated pastoral issues was huge. In the first one, they did a fantastic job. In the second one, not so much. And I just think it's one of them that, yes, they can be trained on it. Yes, it can be done. But realistically, whether all the lecturers will want to do it and whether all the lecturers will be on board, I just don't know. Okay, and another big issue was the idea of cheaper rent. Sam and Charlie were talking about that. Now, that's something that with first years, the university does have the power to control. But beyond that, it's private contractors. Do you think it's quite a high goal, Jack? It's ambitious, okay, but there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Um, and we already have like a list of approved landlords um, in the SU. So there's, there's work that's been done on, 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 this, on this already. Um, and, and I think it's right that in the role of education officer, you continue to work on these things and move things forward. OK, Luke, would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, in first year that, you know, uni accommodation is notoriously quite expensive. That's something that definitely could be changed and definitely something that could be worked on. After that, I mean, who knows? But again, I think lobbying, campaigning and just pushing for cheaper rent is always a good thing. And something that was mentioned by all four candidates was the UCU strikes that took place in February and March last year. There was discussions as whether it was a policy that favoured staff, not students, and whether the assessment should have been made more lenient. Jack, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I thought it was a really interesting point in the debate because it's where we saw some real gaps open up between the candidates, right? Um, we had some candidates um, supporting kind of, you know, quite, quite tough strikes. Some candidates, you know, thinking they should be kind of reined back a bit and and thinking that essentially um, when the strikes go on for too long, they start to interfere with students' education and it should be the role of the officer to put the students' education first. Um, so for me, it was just a point of interest um, in that it really opened up some gaps between the candidates. OK, Luke, would you agree with Jack? For me personally, I think the whole discussion was kind of odd and I think it shows really the disparity in what people think the role is for and what uh, officers are for. An officer are paid by the union to be a voice for the students, not for staff members. Um, I think the idea of staff-student solidarity is fantastic, but it's very idealistic. And I think the strike showed that massively. The students got behind staff, supported them in every way they could. Was the return, was there any, we were talking about before, were assessments made easier? Were special measures made to help students? Not nearly as much as they should have been. And I think this is the thing. I think students are very quick to help staff, but maybe staff aren't quite on the same page as us. So why should our student rep give that voice? OK, and the final thing I'm going to ask you is, can you summarise in a sentence who you think was the standout candidate in that debate? Jack, I'm going to start with you. Blimey, that's, that's, that's a tough ask. Um, um, no, I can't. Um, I think for me, I'm going to give you two. I think it was either Ben or Jazz, just because I think both of them talked with real pragmatism and professionalism and uh, Jazz in particular spoke a lot about rather than I've done this and I've done this all my experience she was actually talking about think ways that she's implemented microcosms of her policies within departmental level and how she's actually got connections with people in them departments people she knows which is such an important thing to have in this job okay now we're going to take a short break and we're going to look at how the SU elections work we'll be back very shortly with the welfare officer debate so do stay tuned Every year, members of our Students' Union get the opportunity to vote on referenda on student issues, elect two new student trustees, and elect eight student officers. The SU officers hold their position for a year, representing us, and getting paid in the process. It's a vital role as the officers are responsible for making the student voice heard and shaping our student experience. 
The eight offices are Education, Development, Activities, Sport, Women's, Welfare, International Students and President. We use alternative vote to elect our officers, which works like this. Voters list as many or as few candidates as they like by preference until they have selected all the candidates they wish to vote for. For example, if four candidates are running for activities officer, you would list the candidate you most want to win first, your next preference second, and so on. But you don't have to vote for all the candidates if you don't want to. And if you really don't want any of the candidates to win, you can vote to reopen nominations. In this example, under First Past the Post, the system we use for general elections, the red hexagon would win despite most people voting against them. Under Alternative Vote, the candidate who has received the fewest first preference votes is eliminated and their second preference votes are redistributed. Votes will continue to be redistributed until one candidate has a clear majority. Under Alternative Vote, Purple Square ends up the winner. We vote the same way for our student trustees, but because more than one is elected, they have a different threshold to reach. Forge will be covering elections every step of the way, so keep your eye on our coverage and make sure that you know your vote. Hello, and my name is Kate Proctor, and welcome back to the Punditry office. Um, I'm here with the two Punditry um, helpers, uh, Jack Matlas and Matthew Hartill. Um, yeah, we're here based in the um, current uh, officer's office, um, where next year's officers, whoever's elected, will be based next year. Um, as you know, if you've just been watching, we've just had the originally the first the women's officers debate, and then the education officers. Next up, we will have welfare officers, followed by activities officers, which will be um, split into two different debates, um, because there's just so many candidates, and we want to give them each a fair chance um, in terms of um, hearing their voice. Um, don't forget to follow us all on social media and our, um, our website page, which is Forge Today, um, forge, um, dot com forge slash elections. Um, I will now speak to the pundits. Um, hi guys. Uh, so, who are you looking forward to um, for our first debate in uh, welfare? I'm looking forward to both. Both there's t two candidates tonight, and what the debate is a really kind of interesting opportunity to do is to kind of see these these kind of snippets of policies kind of extrapolated upon and really fleshed out and kind of interrogated so so i'm just looking forward to see how it unfolds and, and what the candidates uh, kind of make of tonight mm -hmm. it's quite good as well there's only two actually because we can really go into detail on what they've got to say i'm quite interested in sadie actually sadie base who um she's looking slightly more long term she's creating a resource pairing students with improved employers um, and providing better support for students. Well, that's something they both touched on, actually, providing better support for working students. I'm interested in how they deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think what you see quite a lot um, in this debate is a lots of consensus between the candidates. So I'll be interested to see kind of where these points of difference are, where they emerge uh, over the course of the debate as well. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, and was there anything else um, at all in, that, in terms of what you think that uh, they should be focusing on, um, that you haven't heard them focus so far on their policies? A bit like Jack, I, I'm I'm really going to focus on on how they differ because I think I think that's the important thing. It's already good in agree, agreeing, but I've got to differ somewhere, and that's I think what's going to tell the difference between the two of them next week. Really. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. We'll head over to Cameron now to start the debate. Ready. <laughs> Welcome back, and thanks to Kate. We're here with the two candidates, another cosy one for welfare officer. How are we both? I'm We're good. good. Just so in sync, you said that <laughs> at exactly the same time. Yeah, we're um, just twins. The plot twist is we're the same person, no matter who Surprise. you vote for. <laughs> well, <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, mental health is obviously a key issue, the key issue for um, the welfare officer to address. Um, what will you do to, to cater for and support the mental health needs of, of all students? So I think our university actually has a really good mental health service. I think it's really like helpful for so many students and I think it is completely the best place to go to for people with mental health issues. But I think the problem is that with the SAM service, there's one number for everyone's issues. So you could be having just you know some slight stress regarding your degree or you could be completely in need of immediate mental health help and you have to call the same number. And even though the services are, I think, actually very good, that obviously everything can be improved, but I do think they've got a good basis. 
the problem is that they get so clogged up and that's what leads to the waiting time. So what I want to do is put actual pastoral and mental health care in each academic department and that way people have someone they can go to when they're just like before things get as bad as they should need to call the student access to mental health service. So that way it will just like release the pressure on the service and make the wait times a lot shorter, I think. So yeah, what Sadie said is really important and I think building on that like the academic support that needs to be in place from departments like department leaders need to have confidence in delivering support when when it's related to academic stuff even if it is obviously linking to mental health because everything links to mental health mm -hmm. um i also think that we do need to be talking to liberation groups because liberation groups historically have been constantly asking for counselors who are s sort of s trained in that sensitivity so like with BME, you need that sensitivity so that you, they're not gonna drop like a racist or a, a kind of yikes, mo have a yikes moment with them because that's not what you need when you're in therapy. Like you need someone who understands where you're coming from. So we need to kind of fund more kind of counselors that are s liberation group specific. Um, also, we need to, on the social side of stuff, we need to break down the stigma around a lot of different mental health disorders. We talk quite freely about depression and anxiety, but beyond that, it's very difficult to even start the conversations and there's still so much stigma and a lot of students don't know what to do if them or one of their flatmates is struggling with one of these things and they kind of can't accept that mental health isn't always the, sy the symptoms can't always be romanticized. So you kind of need to actually learn how to handle when someone is being like quite difficult because of their mental illness. Um, and you need to know where you can go to get support both for you and for them to make sure that they can recover properly because so many people don't know and will alienate people that are having genuine mental health struggles because they're not acting in a way that's like kind of portrayed in the media where it's all very kind of like romanticized. And I think a lot of the social campaigning side of it needs to focus on that. Like, it's not always pretty. And also, there is so much more than just depression and anxiety. Like, we still need to talk about those, but actually, we need to talk about the other stuff as well. You mentioned stigma. Um, do you feel that that the stigma or, like, the barriers and even, like, being able to get people to, to talk or want to talk about um, certain mental health issues, um, that could be, like, a barrier to your idea with having departmental support? Yeah, I feel like... That would be an issue with anybody's policies for mental health support. I think the thing that would help and I think does do a great job already is the Mental Health Awareness Week. And I think, it, I feel like if anything, my idea to put the help in departments would be useful to people who do feel that stigma because I think it can be, like I know I felt this way, it is scary to call the one number that's like I'm having mental health issues right now because people I think you, like you say the stigma and like Baron said it completely you can feel like you don't you know you don't mean it enough and that you're not as bad as other people and that maybe other people would need it more than you would but I feel like the stigma would be lessened if there was that help in department that was so obvious so vocal like here is the help here's where you can find us that it would mean that people who potentially would feel the stigma calling the main number or calling the main service can get that help within departments. Yeah, so like part of part of reducing the stigma is kind of getting everyone to talk about it. It's all well and good kind of doing campaigns within the SU, but that is always only going to reach a certain bubble. So I think actually like getting academic kind of lecture lecturers and professors to talk about this stuff, to train in this stuff, to feel comfortable talking and kind of giving advice on this stuff, like you know, not not being a counselor, but actually just enough practical advice to help their students is part of what it takes to like take down the stigma because they are gatekeepers and you know it's a it, it passes down it's like then the students are comfortable talking about it then we pass that on to future generations of like the uni and it's kind of just the standard so like the stigma kind of is removed because we we all just talk about it yeah completely i think as well like it is important to recognize that we're all sitting here in the su right now and there's people watching at home but not like everyone is as involved with the SU as we are and as you say like it does need to be rolled out within departments so that it can have access to every student possible like it is completely like you say a complete bubble sometimes within the SU because just not everyone mm -hmm. cares to be interested in what's happening within the SU but they will care when it affects them and it affects their mental health yeah um 100 percent and i'm not sure if there's anything else to add to this <laughs> bit but um i asked the question of the uh, candidates for education officer but um with regards to education officer it's 
a lot of it is to do with trying to get the university to change their practices with sort of mental health as like that would be your sort of remit on that how would you want to like talk to the university get the university to change first of all we need to stop hiding extenuating circumstances like they are not something that people should be ashamed of using they are also not something that you have to justify with like you know essentially like really horrific stuff like you should be able to access these extenuating circumstances if you're struggling with your degree like flat out and you should also feel that your department is supporting you in that and not shaming you and right now you know I have used extenuating circumstances myself before, but I could not tell you every kind of extenuating circumstance that there's a, there is available. And actually, that's wrong because I need to know what options there are for, m for me as a student in my degree to get the best from it. I also think this kind of links into one of my <laughs> other points. In terms of supporting students ac in departments, you need to kind of advertise the learning support plans that are available, particularly for kind of different areas. So like. One area it would be really great for is for students that have to work part-time jobs to kind of pay the bills. Like, you know, it's a reality for many students that you have to have a part-time job to survive. And actually, you have to work very long hours. And that inter interfe interferes with your degree. And so departments should be recognising that and being like, listen, there are ways we can help you so that you can balance your work and your study life. And I think even that, like... It, it kind of shows how mental health is literally ingrained in every aspect of welfare because it does affect everything and it can be affected by everything. So yeah, completely. Yeah, you need to you need to be looking at how the department can support them in multiple different ways. Um, both of you have addressed working students in your manifestos. Um, could you explain uh, how your approach to mental health or welfare issues will, you know, involve? or tackle the issues yeah. that work. So I think the thing I want to do, and I think the thing that I care about most with my campaign for Welfare Officer is that it is a progressive role. And I think that currently some of the things happening with Welfare Officer, not that like anybody's not done an amazing job, like Catherine's done amazing work as Welfare Officer, I should um, <laughs> But what I mean is I think that we have to be constantly moving forward and constantly putting things in place to make the university an even better place than it already is. So I think, like Baron said, like. Supporting students in work is unbelievably important. Like a 2015 study said that eight out of 10 students have part-time jobs, whether that be because they want extra money or because they actually like physically need it to pay the bills, which is the reality for so many students. And I think currently the way that the SU works with jobs and supporting students in work is just abysmal, honestly. Like I think they do amazing work for postgraduate schemes, but in terms of supporting students in part-time work, there is just not enough. I want to create an actual physical and online resource that would be pairing up students looking for part-time jobs, which A, helps them because they don't have to be trawling the streets of Sheffield, applying for every place, printing out millions of CVs. And as well, it's beneficial for the jobs because I would be working through union, like, because as well, like, above everything else, the student union is a union, and we want to, like, take advice from workers' unions and use that advice to know what jobs are best for students and what jobs they're going to be, you know, looked after in, because I know so many people, myself included, that have just experienced being completely messed around by jobs, like, just fired over the Christmas holidays because you can't make it in, things like that. And as well, like, when it comes to trial shifts, like, that's just such a weird, like, whole area. Like, people just are exploited through those kind of systems. And if I can create a resource that basically students come to knowing that they can get a part-time job that will be SU approved out of it. And also, it's beneficial for the jobs as well because then they get to advertise, oh, we're SU approved workers, like, all of that. I think that will just make it so much better for people, also in terms of everything, but also in terms of mental health, because it just takes that strain out of applying to jobs, which can be so hard and such a lengthy period. And if you need the money immediately, there's a system that will be able to do that for you. Yeah, definitely. In terms of kind of having that approved system, it would be really useful. And actually, I think students, a lot of students don't really know their rights when it comes to work. And there definitely. are so many loophole, loopholes that like, mean that employers take advantage of them because they know that they're young and they know that this may well be the first job they've ever had. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that also linking in is kind of making sure that students know their rights yeah. 100%. Like, because the number of times I've listened to stories of employers essentially just like 
if, if a student took that to court, like not that they could because they don't have the money, but if they could, they'd win the case That's because the they're just being illegal. abused. Like, as well as creating the physical resource pairing up students, I would want to make the most obvious place possible because I think the thing that demystifies a lot of student to do, students to do with the SU is that there's so much information that it's hard to know exactly where to go to. Same with the website. I think that that can be quite inaccessible sometimes. But if we have a place that is completely vocally obvious that this is where you should go when you've been mistreated in work, I think that would just help so many students. It's unbelievable. And I think as well, like just heavy, heavy, like we have to be active again, breaking out of that SU bubble. Like you you can have it all here you can have it all in this building but only the students that actually look for it are going to find yeah. it so we very much need to be actively trying to help particularly freshers but also like older students as well get access to that being like listen this sounds like we're just nagging you or we're being boring but actually this could be really useful to you and your job yeah. and here's what to do if it it doesn't seem right in your workplace or mm. even it even extends to like housing and stuff because it's the same with housing like yeah. students don't know their rights there like yeah. the number of landlords that take advantage of them like we need to be proactively pushing these are your rights and this is what you need this is where you come if you feel like those have been violated essentially yeah. that actually links quite nicely to one of my <laughs> points where i really want to in terms of housing, I do really, really want to work with student activist groups such as Cut the Rent and Acorn, things like that that help students know exactly what is the right thing for them. Because I think that historically, I think that the SU hasn't utilised that enough. Like we just have seemingly ignored the work, the really important work that's been done by student activist groups. Whereas they can be, they're like the most knowledgeable voices on the issues. So I don't see why it wouldn't be useful to use them so like organizations such as cut the rent they know so much more than anybody else in the su ever will do about the extremely like just astronomical rent prices that are just going up and up including halls including private accommodation and that you like you said like students just aren't aware of that i know that so many students just like sign up for houses thinking that that's the best they can get i remember i signed up for houses thinking like being pressured into it being told by landlords oh you know if on the 2nd of November you don't sign for this four-bed house, there's never going to be a four-bed house in Sheffield again. Like It's mm. just they put so much pressure on you to make these decisions because they know that that's where they're going to get their money. And, yeah, like, welfare is political and, like, you need kind of political activists to be challenging the issues because when you look at the housing stuff, when you look at the finance stuff, there's a reason that those those prices are rising and we need to be tackling that from the ground and we need people that are passionate about that. And I think particularly with like the word welfare, like a lot of people don't necessarily immediately know what it means and don't see how they fit into it. So I think one of the ways that I'd like to combat that is kind of restructuring the welfare committee that's already here within our union and can do really good work, but actually like getting other societies involved. Like, you know, we have a whole housing section. Why aren't Cut the Rent involved in that? We have a mental health section. Why aren't MHM like why aren't MHM com committee members actively involved in our committee as well? Because it's such similar stuff, but actually, it's about coordinating in a way that is effective. Um, and I think you need to you need to take all this kind of passion for like well campaigning, and you need to bring it into the the kind of upper bit of the SU, like into the officer roles, because it it can. It seems to kind of, there's still like a gap, there's still a kind of us and them, you know, and we need to bring that in and we need to make it welfare, essentially. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> this is nice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, Baron, it feels like a lifetime ago now, um, but you mentioned liberation groups, and yes. liberation groups have can have very, very different you know, requirements or needs as regards yeah. welfare and mental health. What are your plans to... Um, make sure that you address those sort of diverse needs? So I think the primary one is listen and act because there's a lot of listening and not a lot of acting. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the things that liberation groups have been asking for, they've been asking for for years in some capacity. Um, and it's, it's being extremely transparent on how that's going, you know, not falling at the first hurdle. Like, you do have to work f through red tape and bureaucracy to get good change um but actually just because someone has told you no in the first instant doesn't mean that you have to go away and never try and <laughs> do that again um i think it's important to hold forums with the representative committees 
And I also think that it's, again, it's important to make sure that you're transparent and you're actively engaging them so they don't feel like you're just performatively helping them. Like I know from my experience within LGBT that there have been times where very, very well-minded people, like they, they've genuinely wanted to help, but they've also not really known how to do that in a tangible way. And they've kind of, for example, with LGBT, they've put rainbows in everything, but like, the rainbow comes with a responsibility like you need to be doing stuff behind the scenes for that and it's it's something that although the different liberation groups have different needs you have to apply beyond that you have to be like right what can i do to actually help them um and i think you know you have to again you have to start with the groups you have to listen you have to be like right this is what you want and this is what i'm trying to get and i won't stop fighting until i have got that because it's it takes too long this like and we need we need to see some movement. You know, you can negotiate away, and you know it might be small battles and small victories. But actually, you need to see some kind of change. So that's what I'm hoping as welfare officer. Seda, you don't mention um, wealth uh, liberation groups specifically. So, mm -hmm. like, how would you? Yeah, I haven't mentioned them specifically, but I do agree with everything Baron said. I think his uh, point that you need to listen and then act is the most important thing. And I think. Like I said before, I think that the welfare officer should be a progressive role, it should be active, it should be doing things, it should be on the ground helping students wherever and whenever they're needed. And yeah, I think, like, I differ very little from what Baron said, like completely, I think listening and being in conversation with those groups is the most important thing. But then, like you said, putting into place what they've said. And like Baron said, I feel like there are so many things that liberation groups have been asking for for years now that would be very easy seemingly to put through, like things like gender neutral bathrooms, like even something as, you know, small as that, it feels like it would be just easier to put in place than, like, it seems. Yeah. You've both kind of touched upon how welfare is sort of, comes with everything. Like, yes. it's, it's not like yeah, a, a, completely. a separate issue. Or, yeah, or, or I feel a like it's a big old job. <laughs> 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 like, welfare is, I think, the most important, not to like diss the other roles, but like, I think it's the most <laughs> important role in that you can't have a good student experience if you don't have student welfare. Yeah. How would you go about, if elected, sort of working with the other officers? Where, where does the collaboration come in, in terms of ensuring that welfare is, you know? I really love collaborations. Like, <laughs> I personally think they are how you get stuff done. Like, it's not about kind of giving other people your responsibilities. It's about actually involving the relevant people. You know, if I run a campaign around sexual consent, I am immediately going to the women's officer and being like, hey, Let's, let's work on this. If I'm doing something that's a bit bigger and like involves a lot more kind of change within the SU, I'll go to the SU president and be like, do you want to make this part of your campaigns? You know, it is so important to involve the relevant people because actually like, they can give you an insight into what, how to go about it, essentially. Um, and I think, like I said, it does get everything done, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I think seeing the people I've known who've been in SU officer roles, it really does seem to me like the ultimate collaborative role, like working together as a small but like really powerful team. Like I think it would be completely amazing. And like Baron said, like to lean on other people who would have more experience or more knowledge than you. Like like I said before with um, Cut the Rent and things like that, like I'm not coming into this saying that I know everything about welfare, I'm the best person ever. It's completely a collaborative role and it comes from so many sources. 100% as well like it also one of my big things is giving power to students to shape the welfare li like the welfare campaigns the welfare issues it's not to say like giving them responsibility of like giving all the mental health advice it's <laughs> saying like actually if these are the issues that you're worried about come and help like shape how we're going to fix it and I think that's another way of kind of almost breaking out of the SU bubble like it will be difficult and it will involve people within the SU first but once people see that you're kind of you're looking to engage and actually they can make a change. You can definitely engage a lot more people. So, yeah. <laughs> Sadie, you said um, that you don't know everything about Unfortunately. welfare. Unfortunately, we'll get there one day. <laughs> um, everything about welfare and mental health, but what does qualify you for this role? Well, I've got, you know, leadership experience. I've worked with Sheffield Labour students. I've been involved in various different uh, groups and societies across all of you know the university spectrum I've done all kinds of stuff but I think I don't like to think of it as in a tick box sort of situation where I've done this I've done that like 
we're both students, we've both experienced all kinds of different welfare issues. I know that I've experienced a lot of issues with jobs specifically, like I've had two different student part-time jobs and been let go. I'm not even gonna say fired because I didn't do anything wrong. Basically, I've been let go from jobs because I have to go home over the holidays and they say at the start of the jobs, oh no, it's fine, you know, we don't mind you going home over the holidays because they want to keep you on the payroll, they want to keep that you know, instant source of zero hours contract there. But then when it gets to the point where it's inconvenient for them, they let you go. So I think building on that experience, building on my experience of, you know, just being needing the university's welfare positions and policies at different times in my university experience, I think that makes me qualified for the role in that I know what it's like for students who need those positions. And same question for you, Baron. So yeah, like I think you're right in that it isn't a tick box situation. It's you take every experience you've had in your life, like I will take experiences of being treated differently because I'm LGBT, I'll be taking experiences of my mental health, I'll be taking experiences of my experience working and my exam experiences, like my degree experiences, and shaping that. I do think that I have a lot of experience in, I've gained a lot of experience in the last year, like in campaigning, in event managing, like with History Month and with sort of the eating disorders campaign that I've like run as part of welfare committee. I have been on two committees as well, like LGBT and welfare, and have been doing leadership things in those roles. And I think that in general, I've shown that I kind of, I know how the SU works, so I can get sort of on it at the go from the start, like just be trying to make the changes and trying to enact the policies that are gonna kind of, that students are gonna see, but also are gonna help improve the SU. Well, thank you both so much for coming down. Um, as with development and sports, when there's only been two people, it's been very, very nice <laughs> and cordial. Um, but there is obviously, there are differences where there it might see that there are only similarities. So make sure that you keep an eye on all of the elections coverage to know your vote. Um, thank you very much to um, Sadie and to Beren. Thank, thank you for uh, having And us. back to Kate in the studio. Thank you, Cameron. That was certainly a very civil debate with a lot of agreement between the two candidates, possibly to be expected with uh, two welfare officers. I'm here again with uh, Jack and Matthew uh, to discuss uh, the candidates and their different uh, policies. Um, so, guys, what did you think overall of the debate? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. There was a high level of consensus. Both agreed on the importance of mental health, um, on, on, on supporting liberation groups. Um, you know, it was, it was a very, very civil debate um, compared to something like the, the presidential debate last night. Um, one thing I would say is because it was so civil, um, sometimes there wasn't a chance to kind of get into the nitty gritty of policy and really kind of dive down deeply. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was nice to watch. It was pleasing to watch. Yeah, but like, I'm slightly disappointed because because it was so nice and so much agreement, we didn't really get to see those points of difference, which are the most important things, I think. We didn't really get to see how they differ, why they differ, and that's going to be important for next week for when people decide between these two. So I was a little bit disappointed. It was great they agreed so much, but sometimes the disagreements can be just as important, I think. Yeah. So let's get on to a discussion of their individual policies. Um, they both focused a lot um, initially on mental health, possibly um, as such a topical discussion and something that often comes up when you think of welfare. What did you think of their um, individual policies and, and thoughts in regard to how they're going to um, address uh, mental health problems within the student population? Uh, I kind of worry that they've maybe been a little bit too ambitious some some of a couple of um sadie for example she wants to have uh, a pastoral care worker in each department and i don't know how feasible that is to do in just a year it's great that they're thinking on these lines but maybe that's something that you do in within a five ten year scope i think maybe they've been a, a little bit ambitious with some of their ideas i think i think the key thing with this, this pastoral support worker in each department um sadie's kind of build this as it being about kind of reducing the stigma and how lots of people feel intimidated, ringing up the kind of one phone number that's kind of plastered all around the library. But, but my question for Sadie would be, you know, is it, is it really more intimidating or less intimidating to walk into a department and ask for support? Or is it more or less intimidating to just ring a phone number? For me, mm. I think it would be less intimidating mm. to ring a phone number, but it might be different for different people. Yeah. Um, and then moving on, uh, there was uh, a lot of focus from Barron in terms of um, his own individual policy. He was focusing on um, the issue with extenuating circumstances and a lot of students don't know that much detail about it and different ways that they might be able to access that. What did you think of that as a policy? 
I thought he I thought he came across really well on that actually I, I like I said before that I liked how he was focusing very strongly on uh, working students but both of them focused on that and he, he, he made good points about that you know university is expensive students need to work that is it's not you know, extended circumstances shouldn't just be something horrific for deaths etc it can just be that you're working you're tired you need extra time and I think he I thought he came across really well on that point actually mm -hmm. I think there's a question though over where do we draw the line right because if you're going to make extenuating circumstances kind of like really accessible, really easy to kind of to kind of get hold of, then then it opens opens up the field to people who are just essentially lazy, not wanting to do their work, you know, file an extenuating circumstances form, and then and then you kind of lose control of everything. You've got people handing in less, you know essays months late. So 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 there is a question. I, I mean, I, I agree that that we kind of need to standardise it, make it more more kind of transparent and available but there does have to be a line somewhere um, and some kind of method of checking kind of kind of what your circumstances are but I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's saying he's going to take away the methods that are already there to check those processes I just think he's saying you know and they mention stigma a lot around mental health but there's stigma around extended circumstances some people are embarrassed by having to use them and I think he's just saying we need to break down those stigmas which mm -hmm. I think is a good thing yeah, and, and they both um, spoke a lot about um, part-time work and also student rights to with housing, um, those different issues f um, affecting students. What did you think of um, the discussion about those um, issues affecting students w um, outside of the academic um, life of yeah, an individual student? I, I really liked how both of them were quite open and said that they, they were open to collaborations, uh, Baron in particular, amongst the, f the other SU officers, but Sadie was saying that she wants to work with act activist groups, cut the rent, ACORN, things like that. And that's really good because they're coming in, they're, they're holding their hands up saying we don't know it all yet and we're, we're willing to work and that's a great thing. Mm. I'd agree, that's, that, that's a really good thing. And also Sadie's policy of um, kind of having SU approved employers so, so students can go and know that they're getting a job with, with someone who's going to kind of respect that they're a student as well is a really, really interesting idea. I mean, there's obviously the question still over you know what's going to qualify an employer to be SU approved, but as kind of a, as an initial policy idea, I think that's that's a really positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a discussion um, originally from Baron, but also um, Cameron um, brought to Stady as well, do with uh, liberation groups. And I can imagine a lot of people don't really know what was meant by liberation groups, what really that kind of entails. Um, what do you kind of think in terms of what they were both discussing um, in terms of their, their involvement, I guess, essentially? I think this was probably the most interesting part of the debate mm. for me because they both were consistent in saying that liberation groups have been asking for things for too, some things for too long and they questioned a little bit why, for example, gender neutral toilets mm. took so long to, to sort of be rolled out. Uh, and I think that is, that's interesting because hopefully we will, be, we will see more, more dynamism from, from the welfare officer next year perhaps uh, and, and things happening quicker, which I think is a, a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd completely agree with that. And, and, and you know, th there, are, there are lots of okay, SU, SU officer roles um, that can get involved with liberation groups, and, it, and it's good to see the welfare officer candidates from the outset saying, you know, this is going to be a priority for us and it's something we're going to kind of push ahead with straight away. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Matthew and Jack. Um, we're back over to Cameron now with the first of the activities debates. Thank you. OK, so we have a huge number of activities officer candidates this year, so we have taken, for logistical reasons, the decision to randomly select the uh, two groups of activities candidates, and they will all be asked the same questions, so in the uh, interest of fairness. Um, how is everyone in the first activities group? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're all so pleased you were the ones in the first group, right? I can't believe it's Friday. Like, I honestly don't know what day it is anymore. <laughs> so, um, right. Almost everybody has touched on inclusivity and accessibility in societies in, in one way or another in their manifesto. Um, how would you go about ensuring that our societies uh, are as inclusive and accessible as possible? Um, if I yeah, start, start with you, Martha. Um, so a couple of ideas I've had. I've got some experience, a lot of experience in societies and committees. Uh, one thing that I want to do is we have 2,900 committee members. Now, all these committee members, if they want to get here accreditation, they have to attend some sort of SU training session. Now, the way I see that, that's 2,900 opportunities to equip um, our committee members with the necessary skills to recognise if someone is having um, difficulties in mental health or all sorts of other awareness issues. For example, I am a disabled student myself. I have a found hearing loss, which is quite a hidden disability. And I think it's really important that our committee members who you know, do all these fab societies have these, these ways of including our members. Um, as a second point to that, I want to make an inclusions team because our inclusions officers have 
a lot to do and I think that would really help them by recognizing areas of their societies that need to all be brought into the, the main fold of that society. Yeah, so um, actually I agree with Martha about the inclusions training, um, as well as that uh, one of the things that my manifesto focuses on is actually increasing the number of trainings, as you said as well, in for committee members, especially in the second semester and especially the range of trainings as well, as, like you said, mental health awareness training and disability awareness training. And as for accessibility, I'd really like to get the room booking system up to speed with the accessibility options that the room or the building has. Um, Right now, there's a lot of different systems that the university uses to book rooms, for example, like for the SU and then for the other buildings. And I'd really like, if possible, to have them all into one system, just to make it easier for access and also have an image of the room, for example, to see, to recognize it, see the size, see the capacity, and then also have an accessibility option linked onto it if it's disabled access, if it's hearing access, like all the different accesses. Yeah, I totally agree with the room booking system. Um, as somebody who's booked a lot of rooms, it can be very stressful to find the appropriate room. So it's simply having pictures on linked to them, um, having an, a new system altogether would be a great help. Um, and just making sure that everybody has equal access to it. I think there's a lot of times where there's been miscommunications, where people have r double rooms booked. Um, and I think having like a nice timetable where you can clearly see an instant um, being able to like go online and be able to cancel a room booking would also be really useful because at the moment you just need to email the room booking's email address and they have to do it manually um, and another society could clearly see oh there's a gap there now we could now use it and it'd be more activities basically. I think, um, um, oh. sorry if we could spring Harry first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think also something that needs to be worked on is improving the way that we do handovers because when I uh, joined Film Unit as inclusions officer, I found that um, I wasn't really given much information by the previous officer. So I think if we update it and just make it more understandable for people so you know like a better system of handing over because inclusions a lot of the time, it's not about just one person, it's being like in the society as part of it, everyone working together to really make sure that no one's being left out. I think that's really important. Um, I just want to add one thing to the room booking, because uh, something that I've been involved of and aware of, that the university has invested a lot of money into a new room booking system. And as activity officer, I would work really hard to see that implemented. Something else that was on my manifesto was that we would make this full room booking timetable. And I think something that's really key as well is we have um, my idea of like first, second, third reserves, where it's not where you're putting people on a waiting list, because that's not ideal for our societies at all. But what it's doing is it's increasing the efficiency of the system. So if someone has booked a room and then they say, oh no, actually I don't need this, they can contact that society who's on the first reserve and say, we know you have this room booked, but actually would this be more ideal? Would this help you out? And I think then that would just really save the amount of room bookings, like we say, that we do have going to waste because the, assist the system just isn't efficient enough and that would really help our societies as well. Um, it was touched upon as regards sort of training sessions and, and inclusions training. Sports is, is often an area where that gets discussed a lot. Uh, in Pride in Sport Week, there were uh, training sessions put on and consultation about how sports can be made more accessible. Um, do you feel like we really do need that with our societies? Is that something that's like a high priority for you? Um, I think it can really vary from society to society. Um, some societies will be large enough to be able to have, like Martha was suggesting, a team of inclusions members. Like my society, personally, like this year we have introduced set roles. Um, so we now have a postgraduate um, ambassador, a boys ambassador, because our society is mainly girls, um, or people who identify as women, um, LGBT, we, we are able to do that. But I think with especially new societies and small societies who might be receiving inclusion training for the first time and not necessarily knowing how it works, what's going on, um, I think by having that training there and improving the accessibility to the training, making it digitally available all year round, um, I think that's something that they can go back to. And I think it's something that's doable. I think, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I was just going to say that I think this sort of highlights a bigger problem with the training system as a whole in that um, often it's more about stuff like leadership skills, which doesn't really 
mean anything practically when you're running a society. I want it to be more about the um, the trainings are really stuff that you're going to use. Like you have something specific for all the major roles that you would have in a society, and it's more about understanding. Okay, this is what I'm going to be using in that position. You know, this is what I need to know. I think um, as far as inclusions go, I think personally because I was an inclusions officer as well this year, um, only as far as I know, again, as president and inclusions officer, is it necessary that your training has some sort of inclusions training? I feel like the rest of the committee don't really have a sort of said, set aside part of their training to go for inclusions. And I think it's actually really important that the whole committee understands what inclusions is. Um, personally, in being an international student and also an underage international student in first year, um, what one thing I found was that a lot of societies, and that might also just be uni culture, was going out to like a pub or a West Street bar crawl or something, and I would never be able to partake in that because I was 17 for 75% of my first year. And I think it's just really important for most committee members to understand so that it's not just the inclusions officer's responsibility to say, maybe we should have a wider range of socials. Mm, I totally, oh. No, I just wanted to add in, um, uh, we're going back earlier to when you're saying about having it like digitally available. I think that's why um, the activity zone have like such great resources online already. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of is already available. I think as well what Bumi was saying as well. My idea of having like train that kind of inclusion training. It would be like five minutes in all here accredited programs. And I think it's just such a great way to get it. Like we like we said, inclusion should be so inherently available. Um, one more thing I had was that I want to introduce like buddy roles into our societies because some people they can't be committee members like they, too much um, for them to take on as well. And I think there's real scope that we could have experienced society members who are these like buddies and their points of contact as well. And that would just, they would be almost like, I don't know, a lower part of the committee, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it would really, really help with members knowing they had someone who wasn't like the committee member if they felt like they couldn't go to them for whatever reason. Did you have something to add? Yeah, um, it was kind of going back to um, that inclusions training and kind of having more awareness of the understanding of inclusions. Because um, I'm aware that inclusions isn't just a set thing. There's no tick list of what you have to do. Um, it's a whole, it's, it's an amazing role, but it's very difficult to understand how to go about um, having that role. And I know quite a few societies link it to something else or I've even heard of societies changing the name of inclusions because it's not very clear. And I think with this training that we all, we all really support, I guess, um, I think making all committee members aware of like what inclusion actually is. So um, to move on to our second question, um, many candidates for activities officer have mentioned the idea of collaboration or competition uh, between societies. Uh, this idea of a sort of society's varsity is something that's been floated around a lot in the past, but we've not yet seen it materialize. What do you want to see in the form of collaboration and, uh, and competition, and how do you feel you'll be able to implement this? Should we start with Harry? Um, yeah, it's not necessarily relevant to society's varsity, but one thing that I've noticed SOTCOM do, which I really like, is they um, so I'm the academic and departmental liaison, and so we get all those societies in a group so that they know they can talk to us about like any issues they're having. I think I want to do something similar, but with the social sex of all those societies that are related to each other, so that they can easily communicate to each other, and it'll just really encourage people to create more joint socials and more integration between societies. Um, just as a kind of counterpoint to that as well, um, I think it would be great to have our social sex for like socials, but our societies do so much more than hold socials. And one of my key points is to organise Society Showcase Week, which isn't for like recruitment, which is why we have the Freshers and Refreshers Fair. It would be really to show off what our amazing societies do. Um, and something that to make this work, it would have to be implemented right from the word go. And it would have to be something very much driven from like the Activities Officer Societies Committee to find out what societies need to make their vision of showing off their society work. And something that could work is having at the refreshers fair being like, this is what we're going to do. You should come along, you should come and see it. And that, that would really help as well. And I think it would give them a great opportunity. I think um, with collaboration, what my manifesto was trying to suggest was for societies to get involved with RAG and volunteering, which actually 
being part of RAG, we've, we've been trying to organize for a while is our RAG week. And what we're now doing is getting all societies to collaborate and do one whole week of fundraising to raise money for a, a, a chosen charity. And I think it's really good because it's not only in the terms of like fundraising going to be beneficial, but also in the terms of collaboration going to show, it's like a showcase week essentially going to showcase all the amazing societies that our union has to offer. And I think that's really important. Yeah, for me, in terms of collaboration, I want to make it a lot more easier. Um, at the moment, as a society president, I get a lot of emails, a lot of Facebook messages to our page. Can you do this? Can you do that? We would love to. And I know a lot of societies are in a similar posi position that you get these requests, and it's not always feasible. So I want to make a platform um, similar to the shared equipment drive that we currently have, where societies can share the equipment and um, essentially save money on all sorts, um, but they can request skills, request people essentially. Um, when I've been speaking to some of the smaller societies, that's one thing that they do struggle with. So if they are putting on an event, um, they need the people to either attend the event or just um, be part of it, showcasing performances, skills, anything. It could be camera skills or art skills or yoga, te anything. Um, and having a key place where you can request or offer up your own skills. I think that would be really useful in organizing these collaborations. Great. That was a lot quicker than the first. Um, so on to the third question. Um, I have I asked a similar question yesterday of um, the candidates for sports officer. But Wednesday afternoons off is like such a huge issue for society. Uh, is such a huge issue for societies as well as sports clubs. So how would you go about lobbying the un university to keep Wednesday afternoons free for all students? Um, so this is something that is very central to my manifesto because I believe, especially at the moment, that very rightly so, the focus of well-being should be really central to university. And I think it's something that has happened. Um, we have got Wednesday afternoons off, but I think it's been slowly creeping back in where it hasn't happened. And I think the role here should be to highlight to the university the importance for all students to have one afternoon free a week where they don't do their stressful degree. I mean, for example, we've a lot of people have moved to this new city and there's so much to do and there's for example in the Sheffield Student Union as well there's so many societies who offer give it a go events and I think the lobbying the university would would take time but I feel it's really important not only for society and sports teams but just from a general well-being point of view. Yeah I definitely echo Martha's point there it's been tried before and it's something that is going to take time and it's going to take effort but it's definitely worth it because even just for general mental well-being, as you said. Um, and just the opportunity for societies to have that day where everybody can be available. Like sports teams often say, like they can lose a lot of their team to games, matches that happen on a Wednesday just because people are in labs or they're in seminars and postgraduate students especially. Um, I know they're often timetabled on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, so kind of linking back to that inclusions aspect, if people aren't able to attend activities, then they're not going to be able to get involved. I think it, look, you go first this time. <laughs> I agree with um, what Beth and Martha have just said. Um, personally, in first and second year, I know I had labs on Wednesday afternoon, so that stopped me from joining sports or societies in some way or the other. However, also like working with the education officer will be really important on this point, just to lobby to the university how important, like you guys said, mental well-being is. Not having uni at every single day of the week or just having one afternoon where you can have a set aside time to do something else? I think it would be more than just the education officer. I think it should be a, a real, all the officers should really be involved. I think it would be a big group effort because especially bridging the gap between the student union and the university to really make this happen. Yeah, yeah I, I was just about to say the same thing. Basically, it's about working with the sports officers, especially, and education, just everyone really a united front telling the departments that it's really not okay to uh, sort of be taking this back. We need it because university is stressful enough as it is. You need some space just to take time for yourself. So on to the fourth. What places you best as the candidate to support students involved in all societies? Um, and sort of how would you support the sm more smaller or like niche societies? I mean, during my time at university, I've been a member of very, very many societies. Um, I've kind of lost count after a while. So 
I've sort of had experience from all across the students' experience. I was, I've been on film unit committee, which is like a very big, um, it's a very big working committee and we have screenings every week, but I've also been on book club committee where we only have um, like 30 members, I think. So it's really um, using that experience from both of them to try and represent everyone as best I can. Um, yeah, so same as me. I've been on a working committee, RAG, and International Students Committee, and as well as being on a smaller society, Science Brainwave. So I feel like I've had the experience of being both on a big, bigger scale society as well as a smaller one. And I've seen, not just in the big ones, but as, not just in the small ones, but also in the big ones, it's really been difficult to get students involved. And I think now being on committees for two years, I will be, I'll do my best to get as many students involved as possible. So um, I think, really glad you asked that question. Um, I think for me, I sat as a liaison on societies committee for the year and I've represented one of the largest groups of societies and they range from being new societies and right to very, very large societies. Um, and that experience of the different issues that they face alongside uh, being a president and social sec of another very large society. Um, my manifesto points have been carefully thought through to address all of their needs and my experience would would help like all of them I think I think we've all we've all had a lot of experience between us um, again being president of a committee secretary um, being part of smaller societies and just understanding their needs and being part of larger societies and kind of comparing and having that wide variety um, <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to pick on, uh, pick up on something that Boomi was saying about uh, getting people involved with societies. This is one of my key points in my manifesto that I want to try and make the website easier to understand for students because I feel like at the moment it's it's a bit of a mess. You only really find a society if you're already looking for it. So I feel like having just a list of all societies on there and maybe on the front page you could add like a society showcase for society a week would really help. Um, I think it's cool you say that because um, something I want to do as well is but for the iSheffield app or indeed the new Sheffield uh, Union app that is coming out um, I want to allow societies to be able to showcase their events which I think would sort of be what you're saying um, but through doing this they could at the start of the year sort of tick through things that they're interested in I think that would help societies really en engage with new people who will see these events and think, oh, that looks cool, um, and otherwise wouldn't be involved? Yeah, I think it's very difficult um, to promote all societies w as much as we would like to because there's over 350 societies. If you're putting it all in one big list, that's a lot to scroll through. I think like what Martha said about being able to select ideas, it's great that we have the activities fair and people can wander around, but things do get missed. Um, and I think you have to be work out a system where all societies can promote themselves and made, be made aware of who will be interested in them. Great. How would you help societies to publicise themselves in order to ensure that all students are aware of the activities available to them during their time at university? Uh, well, this would be partly working on improving training so that publicity officers understand what they need to do. Um, also, just I think uh, when the new committee gets elected, having a like a closer relationship with them, making sure that they know that the university can help them, and changing the or updating the information that we give them because sometimes it's quite sparse. I want to really flesh things out so they know exactly everything they can do. I think um, going back to what Bethan said about the activities fair being quite um, something is being missed out. Um, something that I was thinking about in the last couple of days as I was speaking to people was maybe doing different fairs for different things. So maybe ha I think when I was in first year, actually, there was a sports fair and an activities fair separately. But as far as I'm aware now, it's one fair. And I think it'd be really good to bring that back because some students don't want to get involved in sports and want to get involved in societies and vice versa. I think we I had think two fairs yeah, this year. It was the refreshers fair that got, um, for many reasons, uh, was everything all at once, which uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with because refreshers, I think, is a great opportunity not only for societies to get new members, but to showcase what they're doing. 
Yeah, particularly for Erasmus students as well, coming over, um, having refreshers fair, I think we could definitely make more of an impact of how, how we present that. Um, yeah, uh, another point in my manifesto, I want to uh, create a pamphlet that's available all around the SU so that uh, it'd have information on all the societies in that uh, you, the president would give in at the start of year. And then also, because I'm aware, like I want to try and update it every semester so you can include the new societies, like SOTCOM's created or appointed uh, 30 new societies. I want, sorry. Um, I think that would have to be quite a large pamphlet because we have so, so many societies. I don't think either that it would be terribly sustainability friendly, which is why I think if it was on the iSheffield app, and I think it then, in that case, it could be more focused, because there's nothing worse, I think we all know, than when you're standing on the concourse, for example, or when you're just getting things that you're not interested about, and that's, that's not in a harsh way, that we all have very different interests, that's what makes us great. Um, I think if it was on, on the iSheffield app, you could focus in what you're interested in, and then the societies could, when they advertise their event, they say this would apply to people who have ticked these various options. Yeah. I think that would be much. I don't think it has to be like a pamphlet, like we're handing them out all over the concourse. It's more like something that's available at the welcome desk. You could maybe look through if you want, if you prefer but isn't that like person. part of the issue? Because if people want to, and like we're, we're trying to get people engaged, where mm. if they have to go looking for it, whereas we're all on the iSheffield app all the time. I mean, our timetable's on well, there. I mean, it's computers. also, I mean, it's a joint policy. I'm trying to update the website and create in person, because I know that, at least for me, I prefer actually like going and meeting with people or looking through something. It mm. just helps me to understand things. So the website isn't always the best option for yeah. people. I think we have to be quite aware of people that aren't engaging with this issue already. Um, as we're all being committee members and society members, we are around the issue a lot. If there's this directory or pamphlet at the SU desk, it's not going to be massively accessible to people that might be quite nervous or anybody who's just not around the SU that often. I actually agree with that. Um, I was around halls of residences earlier this, like just yesterday, speaking to a lot of first year and postgraduate students and realized that a lot of them are not actually involved in societies. And what you said is right. If people don't come to the SU generally, they don't come to the SU at all. So I think one thing I'd like to do is maybe show, have like uh, those screens around like the ridge and the edge showcasing events that are going on in the SU for people who are sitting over there to have a, s to have a look at and decide, oh, maybe I should go to that. I mean, yeah, can I just say, this isn't something that just has to be at the Students' Union. That's just the one that's most obvious to people, but it can be around at the edge. And yeah, I th yeah, I still think social media would probably be the easiest way to go forward with that sort of idea. But well, that It would also be on social media. It's not just a physical pamphlet that's i feel like you're focusing too much on the physical thing no it's no no not at all i mean try and make it um, everywhere i i wouldn't necessarily agree with having both a, a physical something printed when uh, we're all trying to reduce our carbon footprint and things like that when it, it could be online which is for def definitely for a student age group that's such an easier way to engage with the student population what do you think are some of the biggest barriers um to students sort of getting involved in our societies and our committees to the absolute fullest that they can? Definitely, I think just not knowing what is out there, not having uh, very obvious signposted people to go to, and even to an extent not having people to go to give it a goes with, which is why I really want to encourage this inclusion team buddy roles, people who can be the obvious friendly faces in that case. I think I agree, it's, it's just the lack of knowledge but as well as maybe the fear of getting involved I know for a fact as an international student when I came to uni I didn't get involved in any societies in my first semester of university because I was too afraid and it was only until I'd made a few friends and my course until refreshers fair of my first year when I actually went out to the fair and decided I'm going to join and I think something to implement is to think about international students, postgraduate students, mature students these are the students that don't generally get involved with societies and international students have a great intro week that they have before our orientation, before our, or intro, sorry, yeah, they have an orientation <laughs> week before our intro week. And it'd be really good if they had, maybe not a fair, but like a virtual fair happening at that time for them to see with their buddies who are running the orientation week to, to encourage them to join societies and things. So like on social media, on the app and stuff? Or like, yeah. yeah, okay. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think you've got to look at the barriers for all students. Um, so people who just don't know exactly what Martha said, people who don't know what's going off, but then also different types of barriers for, like, what Bumi was saying about people who don't typically get involved, so international students, mature students, even commuting students. Um, and I think we've got to work very closely with the amazing working committees that we've got um, to really explore because barriers are always changing. Um, people face different things every day. Um, and I think really understanding from different um, groups of students how they might have been prevented from getting involved and really working with our societies, working with our volunteering opportunities um, to just work alongside and find out how we can be doing more to get people involved. And finally, Harry. Uh, yeah, so I, um, as part of the bit on the website, like you'd have information on societies, but also on when they meet, because I mean, I know um, when I'm talking to friends and stuff, I'll mention a society that I've been doing, and they'll say, oh, that sounds amazing, but I had no idea they existed. So it's really about trying to work on training for publicity officers so they know how to get themselves out there, improve the website and the way that um, the SU tells people about societies so that we really, like, people know exactly what's available. So. Perfect, thank you. So that concludes the first debate for activities officer candidates. Um, in After Kate and the pundits have spoken about this first one, we'll be back for the second group. Over to Kate. Cheers. Thank you, Cameron. Um, that was a great um, and very civil first debate from the activity um, um, running officers. Um, so I'm here now with pundits uh, David and Luke. Um, Hi guys. Um, so in terms of discussing their different policies, I thought we could start with talking about um, their different ideas for inclusions. Um, Harry um, and Boomi talked a lot about different training systems um, and Martha talked about um, actually a specific inclusions team. Um, I what do you guys think of their different ideas and um, policies on inclusions? I think the idea with Harry's idea of getting students to be inclusions officers within a team you can't expect students to be comprehensive pastoral care. That's why we have mental health services within the university that train professionals who spent a significant number of years training and perfecting to be able to deal with people who have these problems. To burden that on a student who may have issues of their own, I think is perhaps going to be complicated and quite difficult to implement. Yeah, I'd completely agree. Um, I think having served on working committees, we're quite fortunate to have the assistance of specialist development team, who are obviously trained professionals hired by the union, and they provide that service. I think the quality they provide is what the smaller societies need, as opposed to just students looking after students. I think, like you said, I think it's a bit too much to ask of a student, and I think the, the level of quality that the, the hired professionals provide is much better. Okay. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion about different types of showcasing of societies. Um, Martha specifically talked about um, a society showcase week. Um, there was a lot of them have policies to do with kind of inter-society collaborations um, and competitions. And there was also a lot of discussion of different ideas to do with apps um, and promotion of different societies. Um, I was just wondering what you guys thought of those different policies and kind of which ones you thought would be most effective. Well, I think the idea of a showcase is kind of already one that we have. So Freshers' Fair happens in Freshers' Week and in Refreshers in the second semester. And that is a big celebration in the Octagon where we have most of the societies on show. There'll be people performing on stage at regular intervals to say what their society is all about. To then set up a separate showcase to me seems a bit counterproductive when we already have an event that celebrates everything societies have to offer. So I think a more appropriate approach would be to take the app. Now, maybe not necessarily in I Sheffield because I don't think that has perhaps the reach that they would like it to be. I think maybe putting something on Mole or on the sheffield.ac.uk website would be effective and a great policy. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one thing that really I've, one of the highlights for me was um, Boomy's idea of a kind of uh, volunteering fundraising week and more focus on that. Um, I think that's an amazing way to showcase um, what the societies do. I think obviously it's all for a good cause and it would be a, you know, a really good common goal. I think it's a really great way that you could actually incentivise different societies to work towards it. Say whoever raised the most money, maybe get free tickets for Pop-Tarts, things like that. I think it's just a really good idea and I think obviously um, all for a good cause and all which is an added little bonus. But I think it's definitely something that would encourage people to you know, get out there and show off what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of current issues that have also been ongoing um, from the sounds of things for a, a number of years, um, those include um, 
uh, to do with room bookings, there was mention of that, and also um, access um, to equipment. Um, Bethan talked about the idea of sharing equipment between different societies. She also talked about the issue to do with cancellation and room cancellation. Um, and then um, Martha was very concerned about um, the encroachment on Wednesday afternoons um, from the academic side of things. What did you guys think of those um, different policies and what the other officers said um, in terms of um, treating those issues? I like Bethan's idea of sharing resources. I think that's a good one. The only downside to it, I can think, is perhaps implementing penalties. So if people don't return the equipment, whether they forget or it's intentional, there needs to be a penalty because otherwise they're going to run out of equipment fast and the university doesn't have unlimited money. So I think sharing equipment is a good idea to go forward. Mm -hmm. See, I completely disagree, to be honest. I think actually it's such a vital area for... Like, okay, so we're all on Forge TV, we're all currently on a Forge TV stream. We look around and we see all the equipment that we use. We're heavily reliant on this equipment and it costs you know, a, a pretty penny. And we're very fortunate to have it. And obviously some of the small sites don't have access to that equipment and that's fair enough. But the problem is that not necessarily all the sites will need it in the same way they do. It would be useful for them to help promote themselves, to help work on all the projects they want to. But for us, it is a vital part of our equipment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where this sharing aspect comes into it. I think there's been problems with us personally sharing equipment with mm -hmm. other societies and it not going down particularly well. Um, so I just think, you know, in reality, there's going to be problems with that mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, Pulsar. And do you think it's better with the current system where actually as a, a society ourselves we often help maybe say sports teams but also societies by actually doing the filming for instance for them rather than they doing it themselves? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good way to you know encourage collab, encourage people to work together and rather than sharing equipment. I think Bethan mentioned the thing about sharing skills, which mm -hmm. and having a spreadsheet saying maybe you know we need someone who's good at this because there's been times when we've wanted to do productions and we've said things like oh why don't we get makeup society to come in? Why don't we get Supas to come and do the acting for it? And I think that idea is far better than us just saying here's our stuff mm. um, I think it really encourages people to work together and it it promotes both societies which is obviously the, the main goal of all of it mm -hmm. I'd say Luke is right, collaboration in my experience hasn't been an issue okay, perhaps at some smaller societies that may not be the case, I haven't experienced that but at least in the societies that I have experienced, there's been great collaboration and I don't think it's something that needs to be focused on to push further. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David and Luke. We're back over to the second activities officers debate. Um, over to Cameron now. Thank you, Kate. And we're now on to the second part of the activities officer candidate debates and the final debate of 2019 SU elections. So um, you're all in the, the main event if this were a sort of boxing event. It's not, so <laughs> they're all equal. Um, same questions as before, uh, let's go. So almost everybody has touched on inclusivity and accessibility in societies in their manifestos. How would you go about ensuring that uh, our societies are inclusive and accessible as possible? So uh, one of my main points is uh, ensuring a framework that exists for all the societies. Um, things such as a lot of visible and non-visible disabilities aren't ensured during the events and societies don't take care of it when they organize a lot of events. They can be things like strobe lights during events that can hit someone with who's got epilepsy. Yeah. So that is one main point where we have a, a sort of like a checklist that ensures that okay the main points are covered and that can be made with collaboration with a lot of working committees and representative committees, so we can even counteract things like cultural appropriation during events. That's definitely for um, accessibility. For inclusivity, one of our main points would be um, getting the representative committees involved because they have a lot of campaigns running for inclusivity. A lot of times the campaign remain to themselves. They never go out to the societies. So like We Are International was a massive campaign supported by the university. So maybe the future officers and the students' union can ensure that these campaigns reach out not just to the committees itself, but to the societies as well. Yeah, so um, I would agree on similar points as well in terms of, uh, as activities officer, it is not just you um, trying to fix everything. There's very much a need for communication with the other officers and with, as well, representative committees and talking to international students um, but also, as activities officer, uh, I very much see the role as being, as providing a platform for people to bounce off of in order to find the 
amazing and uniqueness of all of these societies. So uh, for accessibility, um, I would use, I've promoted in my manifesto of having a very active activities um, officers blog, where I will go to these societies either by being requested by people themselves or by randomly picking them because there's so many societies, it would be unfair to pick certain ones um, myself and going to their society, spending a day in those workshops, talking to these people and then writing a blog about it and it will all being positive um, publication, um, publicity and using that, posting that online will allow students to see exactly what it's like in the day of that society and if they have any general questions about inclusivity um, and whether or not a society is right for them or feeling like they're not being able to join into these certain societies coming to me, me being able to talk to res representative committees and the other officers in order to make the environment much more um, safer and or feeling much more supportive for the, stu the students themselves. No, yeah, that's really like exactly the kind of point I'm trying to make, but um, it's because we work with such a, a, a amazing group of inclusions officers and secretaries already that I mainly just want to encourage them, uh, make sure they're acknowledged for the hard work they do, because they do come up with creative ideas, much more creative than one uh, activities officer could come up with by themselves. So I just want to make sure that they're given the tools they need. Because um, even just in this election this year, uh, some of the campaigns people have come up with to promote themselves have been phenomenal. Uh, and it's things that I wouldn't be able to do without this team um, that, we, that we have set up so well around the union with the training and provided and with the clubs and societies already in place that it really just is about inspiring the people already in the positions of power. On, sorry, just to kind of establish on that as well, because uh, you touched on, on training as well. That is something that I haven't mentioned in my manifesto, but something I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, for uh, I, I think in the total of my experience of being on um, societies and committees, I've attended about 16 training sessions, because uh, uh, I really wanted to get kind of a wide span knowledge of everything. And one thing that I do really want to do is we do have very good um, inclusions training, but it's only for inclusions officers. What I would love to do is have a level and foundation in general uh, training as well for all of the positions about mental health and uh, talking about how you how you make yourself more accessible and your society is more accessible as well. Uh, I think slightly different uh, tangent to how I'd make societies more inclusive is the fact that. I find a lot of societies are often quite uh, cost prohibitive, for example, so uh, for equipment, for uniforms, for example, that are needed. And the uni does offer a participation grant. Uh, it currently has a criteria whether for disabled students, for carers, uh, for people in receipt of the uh, maintenance loan, for example. And I just believe that widening the criteria, the, the criteria for the participation grant uh, would take away the fear of some uh, people, say for example, when I was in first year, I wanted to join a society and then I saw it was at a 50 pound joining fee. And I, d I, I was actually eligible for the, uh, the grant, but I didn't know about it at the time. And I think it's just not only making, yeah, so widening the criteria, but also making it more apparent to students that they can get the support from university uh, to join the societies that they want uh, will just really make, uh, yeah, all the societies a, a bit more inclusive. Um, inclusions training was talked about and uh, mental health and liberation group inclusions training is often spoken about a lot in sports it was touched upon yesterday in the sports officer candidates debate um, do you think that we should be having these same discussions um, for activities yeah definitely um, when you see the work that sports clubs at the University of Sheffield have done it is unparalleled with some of the resources we're stuck with um, and I think societies need to, need to take note from some of the places they've excelled and really mark the places where they're falling short. And sports at University of Sheffield is a great place to find everything you need to know about how to uh, provide better inclusions training, mental health awareness. Uh, they're making great starts, especially with the work Cecilia has done this year um, with events like even just Geek Week so that nobody has to feel ashamed about anything. We're all the same boat. Um, but just keeping on pushing that and following the examples we can. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, no, very much, uh, very, very similar um, ideas and points on that, which is always reassuring. Um, yeah, it is, uh, there is, 
I, I ha having spoken to a lot of, being inclusions officer myself uh, for a society and also speaking to a lot of inclusions officers and also being as president where you are kind of the secondary line of inclusions, um, it has been uh, kind of eye-opening to going between society to society from one society who has an amazing kind of framework for inclusivity, having lots of like first year, second year, third year representatives who are all focused on making sure that they feel comfortable to other societies who I've had conversations with people where they've just like, I'm inclusions officer and I don't know what to do on an active day basis to make sure that my members are feeling included. in so um, there's a lot of, I think, taking from some of the sports um, as well and generally, um, opening communication with the members about what they need to feel supported on a daily day basis, such as, for example, um, in one of my societies, we've include, started to do um, badges whereof you can put down what sort of pronouns that you would like to be answered to, whether or not, because I do uh, comedy, and so uh, su such things as like eye contact or how much physical uh, contact you are comfortable with, having that available just out on a label, but in a in a nice, comfortable way, so that you're not like you're not labeling yourself to say, oh. I'm like just having it as an open field really re releases. I found um, I found some of the pressures of um, feeling like pressures and nerve nerves of talking to these people and talking to kind of committee, just making them more inclusive. I think uh, I think um, like a, a baseline, as I said before in the previous debate, um, sort of a baseline, maybe 15 to 20 minutes inclusions training should be mandatory for all uh, committee members. Is I know, for example, that our um, inclusions officer has a dual role. I can't remember what the role is to be fair in our society, but I feel like inclusions on, on that front gets put on the sidelines slightly. And I believe that all the committee is going to have really good ideas. So maybe not necessarily that they are the inclusions officer, but being able to have that small amount of training so then they can, you know, when, when they're running the society, they can take that into account is a really important factor. Yeah, I feel that um, acknowledgement that the inclusions officer role does matter is the most important thing because a lot of people run for it because it's one of the core positions, but they don't actually see it as something that is mandatory in a society to ensure inclusivity. And I do agree that sports societies are something that is taken part by m a lot of students, and sports committee also runs the Give It A Go programs with the uh, students' union. And as a part of it, you need to ensure that Many more students take part in those give it a goes and social sports more than some of the societies. So ensuring that we have the same framework that works in everything else within the inclusivity of these events as well. Because I definitely agree with the idea of the pronouns, yeah. which is a major thing right now. Absolutely. And another major thing is the cultural diversity that we a lot of times forget because we have a lot of students from loads of places and we have to keep in mind that there are a lot of things that are sensitive to different people we have to keep in mind and maybe coming back to the point of the inclusivity training if that can be improved and developed and included within that and put forward to all the societies I believe that definitely we can go forward with a more inclusive as you and I, I'm sorry just to add on that as well lots of thoughts coming into my mind which is great about debates um, one of the things as well I think is really key is making sure that your inclusions officers or the people and the people on committee for these societies feel stable enough that they can deal with genuine inclusions issues and know who to go to. So one of my um, manifesto points is all about making sure that the communication lines between societies, their, co their committees and the staff is very visible and transparent. So we have a wonderful set of um, liaisons through SOCCOM, for example. We also have the student support group who have been, I, I mean personally, a godsend for me in terms of helping with deal with these things. Just being able to make that more transparent and knowing who to go to if there are inclusion issues which are r bigger than, say, a person on committee, knowing that there is support there and being able to be stable with dealing with those things, I think is really important as well. I'd like to say that uh, we focus a lot on the inclusivity and, uh, I mean, inclusivity is important, what I was trying to say, training of inclusion for just the committee members. What we, what we should also ensure is that when societies do an initial briefing to all the society members, they should know who to go to, what kind of things we're dealing with, 
what kind of inclusivity issues are there because all sports clubs and societies have an initial briefing for all the meetings. So you're not just dealing with your own seven committee members, seven or eight, or whatever it may be. You're dealing with 50 plus society members and if they don't know what kind of things we face, what kind of inclusivity issues there might be, you know, if who to approach, if we have things to talk about, if they're not, um, they're not comfortable with the inclusions officer, who else to talk to, what the correct pathway is, because at the end of the day, we ha we're, we're responsible for hundreds and hundreds of society members. So we have to ensure that as well, that information is transparent and clear to everyone. Many of you um, and many of the activities officer candidates have mentioned the idea of a collaboration or competition between societies. Uh, the idea of society's varsity is something that's been floated a lot, but we've not seen it like fully materialize yet. Um, what do you want to see in terms of um, collaboration and competition? Uh, how do you feel able to implement it? So I'd like to develop uh, an online system where societies can uh, see other societies, they can see all the societies that are available. Uh, they've got information on all the committee members, so they've got email addresses for the respective, um, so like the different roles. And quite simply, it will be able to request, um, quite again, similar to the debate before, and be able to request the skills um, or offer the skills in the sense, so it's a two-way system. Uh, just so the communications are all on a, a central platform. I know from DJ Society, we've often had, uh, we've been requested to do events, and then we've been having to chase up invoices afterwards. And this has just been through Facebook messages or through email. I just believe having it all on one system would just make it a lot more easy. It'd make it a lot more simple and a bit less scary. So it would hope, th in, in hope, that it would uh, incentivize a more collaborative event. I definitely agree with that. And collaboration is a major part for all these societies because we have 350 plus societies with everyone with their individual talents, all the societies showcasing that. And a lot of times societies hunt for these things so that, for example, every society's events needs photographers. We have a photo sock that can provide people with photographers. There is the TSC, which provides people with tech services. So we have a self-sustained students union right now with loads of different activities happening, loads of different stuff. And I believe that if we put that information to use by helping train people that, okay, these are available and helping make a kind of platform where you can actually reach out to other societies, then that would make it much better collaboratively. And uh, could I ask what the second part of the question was? Uh, the question was how, what form you'd like to see the collaboration or competition take uh, and how you'd implement it. Okay, so um, competition wise, it's, it's a bit difficult considering that we have so many different ranges of societies. So it's possible in terms of the performing arts societies where you can have a singing off or a, a kind of like a theater off kind of thing. And it's also possible in other kinds of uh, societies such as the chess society or even dancing societies. So it's just keeping in mind that there's so much different diversity that we have to set up one. Think setting up a single platform would be a bit difficult, but if we actually group it together according to broader categories as they exist right now in the SU, that might make it much more of a healthier competition where they, ac they can actually improve each other by reviewing and giving each other feedback. And that would be one major point where they can come and say, okay, this event we liked it, but it could have been better if you had implemented this or that aspect. Um, so uh, as well as um, having um, collaborative events, which I think are really important, especially for such as uh, raising money for charity or collaborating with the volunteering um, department in order and the work that they do there in order to give back to the community. I think one one thing that I've noticed um, over my years is that being I've ran collaborative events myself. One of my societies I started up last year, a light entertainment evening, which involved showcasing a lot of the uh, special interest societies and the smaller societies, giving them a stage in order to perform, and all the money went to a charity. Um, as successful as that was for the first year, um, what I found was that it was very difficult to start reaching out from nowhere. And so one of the things that my manifesto really focuses on is not just having collaborative um, events and promoting um, actual events f like that, is actually promoting collaborative support as well. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm introducing is the small society sports space, which is not just for small societies, it's also for newer societies as well, where you um, there would be a, a, a space where 
with me there and other staff there as well, where you can talk to other members of societies, other members on committees, talk about your issues, talk about what you're struggling with, talk about your achievements as well, and voice them in a way that you can also have staff on the sidelines to help as well if needed, um, which not only is a great way of just making relationships and sister societies within the union, but you're also building up a support network on not just a staff level, but on a student level as well, which having that would make it a lot easier, in my opinion, to make these massive collaborative events and so forth. So that and also having a society monthly challenge, we have the society um, week, um, Society of the Week, which is going very, very well. Um, but I would also like to uh, promote the Society Monthly Challenges, where the activities officer, uh, myself, would introduce challenges for societies to do, um, which promote collaboration with other societies, doing stuff for volunteering, and that can go towards not only getting Society of the Week, if you manage to complete it, but also get you rewards for your society as well. Uh, I do definitely like the idea of this shared space where people put their skills and talents, but I feel like the most effective ways that people uh, get involved in other societies and they all share their experiences um, are with the big week campaigns such as Rag Week. If there was a society varsity that was on any kind of scale that this university is capable of, then I feel like that is where most people would be, get, be able to see these things. Uh, I know in the last debate there was talk about a showcase for some of the societies to perform. And I feel like that's a brilliant stepping stone for events like a varsity, where Hallam does also have um, so many similar societies that they'd love to share with us. Um, and so many people currently attend the varsity schedule we have for sport that they're just waiting for an excuse to come to even more things and support their friends, find out more things they're interested in, and eventually cooperate two societies together. If you're already in one, you always want your friends to meet and become better friends with everyone else, enjoy the things you love to do. Um, and I really just do think that it's, it's about that big push. Advertising is much easier when you know it's uh, centralized in one week. Um, the, the campaigns this week, uh, this year, such as This Girl Can, always gets massive publicity. Uh, and everybody knows about it. There's shirts everywhere. And it's much easier to uh, convince people that's how they should be moving on with with uh, their societies. Um, I asked a similar question uh, of the candidates for sports officer yesterday, uh, but Wednesday afternoons off is such a huge issue for societies as well as sports clubs. Um, how would you go about lobbying the university to keep Wednesday afternoons free for all students? It's always a tough one, uh, and it gets harder every year as there's pressures for grades to rise and more money to be made. Um, but it is just about keeping the pressure on the university, making sure you're lobbying with the other officers, all getting involved because it affects everybody's position, everybody's time as a student. Um, and there's no easy solution to it. Uh, it was a similar problem with the bus prices going up. As soon as you calm down and let things slip through, that's when they get the better uh, side of us. So it is just about sticking to it continuing with the work that Cecilia has done and the rest of the officers working together with a great team to ensure that the university doesn't have that easy way of backing out of it, going to all of the meetings that we're entitled to go to and making sure they know the firm position that students have of needing Wednesdays free for mental health and for being able to get involved in the world around them. Yeah, I have very, very similar um, thoughts on that as well, especially on, I, uh, I personally know that without being involved in so many societies, it would have completely been a different university experience for me and a much more miserable one at that. Um, I use my societies not only a space to meet new friends, but also take that mental health kind of break that I need from the stress of my academic responsibilities and my general life responsibilities as well. So I think if we if we can continue the work that we're doing now and really emphasize on kind of the 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 mental kind of um, mental health aspect and importance that societies serve for their students that and liaisoning with the wonderful other um, officers as well this is a very big thing that requires a team effort um, I think with that and yeah standing our ground showing that the new activity officer showing that 
they are strong and that they will stand for what students want, which is a little bit of a break. Um, I think with, yeah, with strong leadership, with perseverance and with emphasis on how much of a necessity society participation is for mental health, I think we can do it. That's actually very put, well put forward by both of you. Because I believe that solidarity is the key as well. Because we've got such a wonderful group of officers. And not just that, we understand that mental health awareness is a key. And getting time off during Wednesday afternoons to actually pursue all these different societies and activities actually helps with that. And not only that, at this day and age, there's a lot of pressure from everywhere for job opportunities and everything for us to go out and get way more extracurricular opportunities, grow ourselves holistically. And if we don't get time for that from the university, there's no point, there's no way we can do that outside university time because we as students have got such a busy schedule from all the different backgrounds, different, different faculties. So I definitely agree with the fact that we have to keep up our stand, we have to keep on campaigning. There's the education committee, there's the SU president who works closely with the, um, the entire university and uh, the trustee board. And I feel that as long as we keep these points up and maintain a good representation from the students, so keep a regular feedback from the students that we definitely need a Wednesday afternoon, that gives them the validation. So kind of like a petition that we definitely know that these students require these time off to pursue what they actually want to do. So I think that would keep upholding the Wednesday afternoon's hopes for us. I think generally the case is that Wednesday afternoons should be set aside for uh, sort of outside of academic development. So obviously we've got uh, societies and sports, which are, is, is what most people would think of if they thought of Wednesday afternoons. But I definitely think with wanting to push volunteering, uh, obviously people are often busy on the weekends, for example, and at uni during, during the week. So I think leaving that, that space Wednesday afternoons for people to uh, pursue volunteering opportunities is very important as well. Um, because obviously they'll know it's only a set amount each week and it's not going to clash with timetables. Um, definitely, again, taking away the barrier uh, to get into volunteering and just to make it easier for students. So penultimate question as we start to run out of time is what places you best as the best candidate for activities officer? Um, cool. So I think we're all going to say very similar things to begin with, which is I have tons of experience, uh, which is very true. I do. Um, I've been on committee for nearly, I've been involved in societies and being on committee for two and a, like, yeah, two and a half years. Um, at my last achievement was running um, two societies at once as president, which was no easy feat. Um, but was something that I was incredibly determined to do and I managed to do. Um, very, very well, uh, in my opinion. Um, I also have a ton of experience, not just as president, but as in multiple different committee roles. So I've been an archivist, I've been inclusions officer. I have, I've, I've had my fingers in all the pies, if you excuse the uh, phrase. Um, but not only have I had this experience of leading and fighting for what I believe is right and what the students want, is I've Excuse me. Um, I also, yeah, I I have been on the other side. I have been in the small societies, really struggling to get visibility and being really, I've had to learn from ground zero exactly who to go to, who do I, who do you go to for support, knowing the right channels. Um, and that is a privilege that I have but I don't think it should be a privilege that I, it shouldn't be a privilege, it should be a foundation that everyone has. And so I'm gonna use this experience and I'm gonna use my very, my stubbornness uh, to make people's voices heard and really get the environment to change so that it's not, it's not just big societies, small societies, special interest societies, it's going to be a platform of equal growth and thriving and yeah standing for what students want yeah i definitely agree and that is actually impressive you've done so much and we <laughs> we need this kind of participation from every single student in the students union and what i believe what makes me a good officer a future good officer possibly for the position good contest contestant is that not just the experience <laughs> coming from the different ranges of societies and committees but the research that is required 
by going and talking to all the different societies from different backgrounds, the small ones, the big ones, the creative ones, and understanding the needs because we are a students' union of over 350 societies. And each of them, all the some have very common requirements like more storage space or better room booking systems. But some of them also have other kinds of requirements where, for example, I went to the performing arts societies and they all talked about getting a common booking of equipment facility, if possible. So understanding the needs of all these societies, that makes you a good officer candidate because you're not just putting forward your own policies, but you're actually listening to the students, validating your policies from there and developing it continuously. And that is very important throughout the year. I think um, definitely, again, sort of uh, copying that slightly, but um, being able to listen to members of societies, uh, seeing what they want, and actually listening and then forming like, innovative, inno innovative ideas um, from that uh, is very important in a prospective officer. Uh, I believe often students can see a, a bit of a wall between them and the officers and they feel like uh, what they say may not ever come to fruition. I just think being a very open character, uh, being, yeah, being very transparent, knowing letting people know that your door is always open for comments or for any advice that they need, for example, or for any, any yeah, anything they, they want to suggest is a, yeah, really important for a prospective officer. Uh, obviously, it's an uh, experience. I've been here for almost five years in as many different unique roles um, and been able to get involved in countless sports clubs, societies, uh, charity events. Um, and it's really just that personal level in which I've been able to speak to all of the captains from the places I go and just learn everything I can about them, their individual problems as a society or an event organizer, uh, and really just learn uh, the ins and outs that don't normally get um, spoken about when you want to give big dramatic solutions to problems that everybody has, but it's the small niche things uh, that I've, I've been able to pick up on over the last five years. Um, and our final question, which I'll have to ask you to answer as briefly as possible because we are running out of time, is um, what barriers do you think people face with getting involved in societies? I would say um, the main one is the acknowledgement of the inclusivity issues that gets faced because we have a lot of students from a lot of diverse and cultural backgrounds who want to get involved and they don't have the information, first of all, of how to go forward and join these societies and attempt to do the best in their way possible. And apart from that, also it's the, the job of the societies to actually go out and try to make themselves clear and transparent through better provided events. I think it's that different uh, levels of publicity work for different types of people. So it's often a fact that first years will go to the activities first, kind of a rite of passage. But I know for a fact that most postgraduate students aren't going to go to an activities fair because they're, they're going to see it as, the, I don't know, the, the, it's just not really going to cater to them. And I think it's, yeah, working out ways. So, for example, we've got the new boards out in the concourse at the moment, uh, doing like a society showcase, which has already been said, is going to target different groups of people. And, yeah, generally, I think just different ways of, so, for example, for postgraduates, um, maybe even just simple as an email, just uh, explaining what societies we've got available. Just because often a lot of postgraduates I've spoke to didn't even know that a society for X activity even existed at the uni. Um, so I think the main ones, um, kind of on similar points, is combining the two. Uh, is definitely visibility, not just on the visibility of the societies, but the visibility of the support there for societies to grow and publicize as much as they physically can, and also accessibility. So what I have put my manifesto down to is being as giving more visibility through because as you were saying um, the freshers and refreshers fair does not appeal to everyone and also something that um, through talking to so many people uh, during this campaign season and through just my university experience that I've seen is that the refreshers fair and the freshers fair is not enough um, for all of the societies, which I think is it's done well, but it needs to expand with the expanding amount of societies that we have. So having more of an internet presence, because that is something that a lot of students use, but not just an internet presence, also having the activities officer using their 
their connections, their relationships, to show this as common knowledge and being there direct to direct because um, emails, uh, for me personally, are not enough. And so it requires that face-to-face -face communication. Um, and I think with that, we can really break down um, the, po the problems of visibility and show off everything that we have to offer to prospective students, mature students, people who are leaving, absolutely everyone. Uh, inclusivity and fear of going to something new, obviously massive parts, but it is that getting the word out there, the knowledge that students have, um, and it's a worrying thought that it might have plateaued with what we can do with Facebook and the SU website. Um, so it means we need to look into more creative ways of getting the word out, away from the traditional things we've been doing for the last five or six years, uh, and branching out and speaking to our committees that we already have, just to learn the ways that they've been succeeding currently, and just pushing that as the standard for everybody at university. Thank you very much. So that concludes all of the debates for 2019's SU officer elections. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll be back to Kate now for some final thoughts. Cheers. Thank you, Cameron, uh, for that last debate um, with the activities officers, four of the 11. Um, I'm back here now with David and Luke to discuss uh, their policies. Um, starting with inclusivity, that was a big part of the last activity officers debate. This again was a big part of this one and um, what do you guys think of their different policies? Well I think it was really interesting because right at the end they sort of incorporated inclusivity with barriers into getting into societies and we were talking about it and I think the main ones are probably price, the cost of a society, time and maybe feeling like you don't have the skill set so whilst we've talked a lot about inclusivity today and it is a very important issue and the officers whoever they are will need to work together to ensure that they create a coherent policy I think they've all got really good balance on how they're going to incorporate inclusivity in societies. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, it's talked about a lot. It's very important, like you said. Um, the one thing that I'm kind of found quite interesting was how what the overlap is with welfare in terms of inclusivity. A lot of them are talking about things like mental health, um, in terms of inclusivity, a lot of you know anxieties and things like that about joining, about getting people, you know, encouraging people to join societies. And I just wonder where it falls into you know each officer's remit. And, and I suppose another thing that I found quite interesting. There was a lot of blanket statements tonight um, from both sets of um, activities candidates and I think only very few times was it acknowledged kind of the difference between the bigger and the smaller societies and how they operate and in how and as a result of that how you have to approach inclusions. So I think a lot of like idealistic talk here but not really anything groundbreaking with inclusions unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matt um, in particular talked about grants and the need to kind of widen criteria and also awareness of how to access grants. What did you think of that as a specific issue that he discussed? I think that's very relevant and I think it's a very good policy. Grants for a lot of people whether it be for disability funding or other things, it's too restrictive. It needs to be wider, it needs to be easier, and the forms need to be easier to consume as well because sometimes they're very scary, they're off-putting for people, and it means people are missing out on money they could really, really use to benefit themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree again. I think it's, you know, if you're being really cynical, you could say, oh, the reason they're difficult is to make sure that they're only people that deserve them again. But in reality, they are just overly complicated, and I think the focus is, well, I think people are very much aware of the grants, but I think making them easily accessible, like you said, and easy to apply for is mm -hmm. a real priority. And like I said, it, I think we've brought up quite nicely to that. Yeah. Um, again, there was discussion of collaborations between societies. Um, Abby in particular, I think, brought it up um, originally. Uh, what do you guys think of their different policies, perhaps compared to the last debates, um, their, those candidates' policies? I think there was a greater emphasis this time in that it's up to the societies to choose whether they want to work together. And I think as long as you don't, force societies to work together so I think we'd be prepared to at Forge I'm sure many other societies would want to but it's entirely up to you and creating that independence to work together when you want to versus when you feel like you're being pressured to is a very important thing mm -hmm. yeah I'd agree I think um, the idea of skill sharing um, like an online forum where you could share skills apply for each other's skills is a uh, is something that we spoke about in the last section of Punitra and I think like you said it, it just means that people actually use collaboration when they need it not even just when they want it when they actually do need it and it's beneficial to both parties um, and I think that's the best way to kind of incentivize that uh, sort of work mm -hmm. and in terms of um, improving kind of awareness of societies um, Shannon in particular talked about kind of um, improving uh, like the awareness of societies of the month she talked about the idea of challenges and with involving for instance volunteering and a possible reward system for that what did you think of that as a specific idea from her I love the idea of challenges, I think that's fantastic. I'm not so convinced by the blog because 
it's very difficult to give a fair share to all 350 societies and you might tr may try the society and you may not enjoy it and that's fine but if you're going to write a review of that society you can't criticize it because that's not fair but equally you've got to be honest so i'm not sure how honest that blog will be mm -hmm. um yeah i think for me the thing that kind of I was somewhat skeptical about was the 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 idea of challenges and idea of a society just because again I think there's such a huge range of what a society does and um and what a how a society works and how they operate that kind of judging that fairly and making sure that the right societies are getting the recognition they deserve is a really difficult thing to do I mean even at um society awards at the end of the activity awards at society awards whatever they're mm -hmm. called at the end of the year um I think there's a you know there's a bit of complication about who deserves what awards and I think doing that on a monthly basis just means that certain people won't get the recognition they deserve and some people will get the recognition they maybe don't deserve mm -hmm. and from these officers was there any other policies that stood out to you in particular that um the other officers in the last debate didn't discuss um and that you think actually that's something that you hadn't thought of and should be implemented an idea in the first debate that I didn't have time to mention that I liked, and it was mentioned briefly in this debate as well, was the idea of more Give It A Goes on Wednesday afternoons. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic idea. We have Give It A Goes in freshers and in refreshers, but I think if you have them throughout the year, people then won't get to sort of October or maybe this point in the semester where they think, oh, it's too late, I'm going to have to wait till next year, and they never join. So I think having frequent, maybe bi-weekly Give It A Goes is a great idea, and I think it would be very popular. Mm -hmm. Again, it's going to be something from the first section of debates where um, I think it was Harry who brought up the um, idea of handover and that there should be um, better training in terms of handover, in terms of what's expected at handover. Because I think that's the end of the day is that <clears throat> most societies, you're only in them for a year and you, all you hope to achieve is that you leave it in a better state than you find it. And the only way that societies grow as a whole and get more publicity and more members and just keep doing the amazing stuff that they do is through a good handover and making mm. sure that the person after you is continuing your legacy. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, has been a detriment to a lot of society. So I think so bringing up something like handover is maybe un overlooked, but really, really important part of the whole society process. Mm -hmm. um, across the two um, different activity officer debates, was there any candidates in particular that stood out to you? For me, it had to be Shannon. I think she was very charismatic. I think she had some very sensible ideas and she was the one that stood out to me the most. I agree. I think uh, Shannon um, had a lot of um, good opinions and she was very vocal. But I think as well, Bethan in the first set of debates, I think as a running theme of tonight, she was quite uh, pragmatic and quite. Uh, she pointed out the negatives and as a very negative person, that stands out to me and that appeals to me. Mm -hmm. Well, that concludes uh, today's um, different um, discussions from the different officers. Um, we will be covering the results night next Thursday. And for any more information, you can go to our website, which is forged today forward slash elections. Um, I mean, forgetoday.com forward slash, I mean, forgetoday forward slash elections.com. There we go. Um, thank you to everyone who's been involved in covering this um, and good night.